welcome everyone. Um, Adrian, I'll turn it right over to you, please. Thank you. Good evening, and welcome to a special session of the Dubuque City Council for March 24th, 2022. As a reminder to our participants, you can provide in-person input or virtual audio and written input during tonight's public hearings. Input options during the live meeting include, in-person attendees may approach the podium when the mayor asks if there is any public input for the public hearing they would like to speak to. Remote attendees can log in to GoToMeeting using the login links, phone numbers, and access code that appear on the broadcast and live stream and posted on the front page of the meeting agenda. This option includes audio input and written chat input. If you are participating via computer, indicate which public hearing you would like to speak to in the chat function. If you are participating via phone, indicate that you would like to speak when phone lines are unmuted. All phone lines will be unmuted during each public hearing and city staff will determine the speaking order of the participants. All comments, whether in person or virtual, must be accompanied by a name and address. Additionally, written public input is accepted by contacting the city council directly from the city's webpage at www.cityofdubuque.org slash council contacts and through the city clerk's office email at ctyclerk at cityofdubuque.org. This information will be reiterated during the meeting. In tonight's public hearings are fiscal year 2023 department budgets and Mayor Kavanaugh, I will turn it over to you. All right, thank you, Adrian. So welcome everyone. Um, you might notice we have a fan in the back. I just wanna mention this quickly. Uh, it's a little bit loud. So um, we're, we're working on some temperature issues. So we're making it nice and cool in here for all of us for the evening. Um, but as you speak, if you do speak into the, the microphone, make sure that you're actually talking in the mic and that's the same for the rest of us too so that we can all make sure that we hear and everyone at home can hear. So our first presentation tonight is Five Flags Civic Center. And uh, we have two improvement packages requested, uh, both of which are recommended. So Maria, I will let you get us started. Great, thank you, Mayor. Are you gonna put the, okay, thank you. My name is Marie Ware. I'm the Leisure Services Manager for the City of Dubuque. And thank you for allowing me to present this evening. Um, this evening, I have three separate presentations for your first three budget hearings. Five Flag Civic Center, Grand River Center, and the Ice Center. With Five Flag Civic Center, the Five Flag Civic Center is uh, managed by a private company, ASM Global Management. They do the day-to-day -day operations, and um, that is done through a benchmark that is set according to an agreement that the city entered into between the city of Dubuque and ASM Global. Within that benchmark is all of the general maintenance, the day-to-day -day operations and repairs that take to run the Civic Center. The City of Dubuque is responsible for the oversight of the operations, so that's my responsibility. The building is owned by the City of Dubuque and the capital funding for any projects that are necessary within the center. Um, we also provide for the operating costs for that benchmark. So the benchmark I talked about that is a part that they spend, we provide that um, piece of that. HR Cook is the general manager for the Civic Center. I wanna highlight our Civic Center Commission and give them great thanks for their service over the last year. Our Civic Center Commission has been very, very active, as you know, over the last several years in helping us with each step of the studies that we've performed. And so it's to their credit for their dedication to the center and all of its operations. So in the prior year highlights, one of the major highlights really is that um, ASM Global was able to beat the benchmark. And when they beat it this year, through a lot of blood, sweat, and tears, working through and after the 2020 um, crisis or pandemic, whatever you want to call it, working through that and being able to start bringing that operation out of where um, it was at. They worked tirelessly to achieve, not only just achieving that benchmark, but beating that benchmark. And that's what you'll see in this slide. So you can see that there were two years. In fiscal year 19, they were not able to meet it. And in fiscal year 20, they were not. 19 was a polar vortex that we all might remember. And then of course, 2020 was a pandemic. But they came roaring back because of, of a lot of hustle as well as relationships. 
ASM Global staff worked closely with promoters early on and were accommodating, so they rescheduled and sometimes rescheduled several times to be able to get shows in. They followed protocols and set the standard and even hosted many um, shows that were all um, scheduled before, rescheduled back in, but then also brought in other shows. Those relationships were built early on because we were one of the first in the nation to start opening up on a, on a semi-open basis, small, um, and being able to work our way back to a strong success that you see there. Um, what happens when they beat the benchmark, so when it's above the line, is that we share 50-50. So they receive 50% of that number and then we retain that. But what that means for us is really like we were under budget by that 50% mark. When we talk about other highlights, um, the ASM Global staff were very, um, they hustled again here. Any type of grant opportunity that came along, they were very active in helping to write and move along those grants um, for us to receive to the benefit of our Five Flags Civic Center. There were two SBA grants, and you can see the amounts on the screen, as well as and I, a State of Iowa Arts and Culture Marketing Grant. And those will be, um, you'll see those again in an upcoming budget amendment because we received them after the beginning of this fiscal year along with the request of how the expenditures would go for those. Additionally, um, the merger of a SMG, sorry, all the letters. So the merger of SMG, which was the predecessor of um, ASM Global and AEG, so there was a merger of two companies that brought together and made ASM Global. That has been a really good transition for us as a, we've seen nothing different. We have all the same staff here. They're just a part of a, a new company and that merged company. But that corporate level decision has really helped us because they now have a company that's very focused on the demographics for our venue and looking at what that is, bringing more quality shows in the routings because we're on a routing pattern for um, a number of venues. And those quality shows we've seen in those audiences um, that are coming and the variety of shows that you've seen over the last year. And those are all to the positive of our bottom line. The staff has also created a lot of partnerships within our uh, community. Those are many local businesses and organizations that in a variety of ways either sponsor or bring complimentary services to the Civic Center. When we look at the operating uh, budget, it, uh, Five Flags has a cost to the average property tax cost of $17.93, a great value for what people receive for that funding. This slide shows our historic tax support, property tax support. This is a little different than the benchmark because the benchmark is just part of the expenses. It's the majority, but there still are some things outside of that, like equipment replacements, approved improvement packages like you'll see tonight, or if we have shortfall payments like we had in fiscal year 19 and 20. Additionally, other things that sometimes fall in the operating budget which um, make for this property tax support are the studies that we did about the future of Five Flags Civic Center. What's coming up? Well, all of you are very aware of our future initiative about the future of Five Flags. After hearing a recap of the studies at a recent uh, city council work session, you requested an updated construction cost and updated figures. CSL and Betch Associates uh, will deliver this report to you at the April 18th council meeting. This will provide information to you to determine what your next steps or actions that you'd like to have. So all future initiatives will be related to those decisions. In the capital improvements budget for fiscal year 23, you see there's $600,000. Um, if you decide not to do a referendum, there are facility improvements that are necessary to begin. The projects include improvements like, and these are all in the arena, the lobby areas, the theater, the exterior, and the equipment um, to the building. So it's things like the building is in need of window repairs, painting the steel exterior, resealing the ballroom floor, remodeling and upgrading concession stands, carpet, tile replacement, 
stage dimmer light replacement, dressing room upgrades, orchestra pit lift, uh, refurbishing the stage, and the list I could go on and on for you. Um, also, equipment replacements like sound systems and tables and chairs and water fountains and popcorn poppers and a lot of other things that are in need of replacement at this time. If you decide to go to a vote, there are some things that we already have budgeted in our fiscal year budget that still need to happen in order to be able to maintain our operations until closing if a bond issue is passed. If, for example, you also put a bond issue on the ballot and it wouldn't pass, we still need money to be able to do improvements to be able to keep the building operational. So you'll see that this is a $6 million project. If you recall, in the previous fiscal years, this was all funded in one fiscal year, but it's been separated out in these three years that you see here. We also realize that the recent economic events has, have resulted in the $6 million cost, which we started with several years ago and had escalated appropriately. However, no one of us could have figured what the cost escalation is now. And so we would, um, in fiscal year 24, likely be coming back and adding some money to this $6 million project just because what was $6 million is no longer $6 million. Um, so that's that. Then for uh, requested improvement packages, um, an information kiosk is a really important um, ad potential addition for us. What this information kiosk will allow is that typically you would go and someone would take your ticket. Um, in many places now you see there's scanners for you to be able to come in with. So you have ticket, you can come in and scan it. These um, kiosks will also provide information as well, so they can be a self-service kiosk. So if you'd like to be able to look for your seating location, where's the restrooms, where's the concession stand, you can look that up all on your own and you don't necessarily have to interact with staff. Um, that's been an, an improvement that a lot of places have made during this kind of changeover of how you interact with people is to be able to uh, somewhat mechanize that the other positive for this is that it can be programmed in different languages. And so if a person needs Spanish, they could click and get Spanish. Um, and that would be very helpful. The second, addition, or second improvement package would be <laughs> cameras. This would be adding cameras to the theater, the Majestic, and the Bijou rooms. So we've done several phases of cameras, and this is a phase to cover the, these areas that we have not done yet. Our other two uh, capital improvements that are in the budget request relate to the theater plaster restoration. A water leak in the theater caused damage on two levels from the front left box seat down to the floor, causing damage to the historic plaster to repair. The damage was under the city's insurance deductible However, what we did is, if we are gonna do that, we also added one other area where we need to make a repair of a pipe that's in a wall. And so if you're gonna do historic plaster in one area, let's do it in the same, um, within that same project. And so uh, that project is here. Additionally, the city's fire escape inspection identified several deficiencies and these findings, um, so th this capital improvement for the fire escape will address those deficiencies. Five Flags Civic Center has a performance measure, and we're excited to report that in fiscal year 21, they increased by 11% the performing arts programming that was held at the Five Flags Civic Center, another piece of success for our center. And with that, I'll answer any questions you might have related to Five Flags. Okay, thank you very much, Marie. So before we open up for um, public comment first here, I, I'd, I'd like to ask a favor, please. Could someone actually turn that fan down just a notch or two? <laughs> thank you very much, HR, I, I appreciate that. I, um, it, it, just, it is a little bit loud to be able to hear everything. I wanna make sure that everyone's able to hear, so thank you. Um, Adrian, if we could open for public comment, please. At this time, anyone participating in the meeting in person who would like to discuss this public hearing may approach the podium when the mayor asks if there is any in-person input for this public hearing. For all remote attendees, please enter your name and address in the chat function and state your question or state your name and address over the phone when the mayor asks if there is any virtual input for this public hearing. Please begin your input by stating your name and address. 
All right, thank you, Adrian. Do we have any public comment for the Five Flags Civic Center presentation? Anyone virtually? No virtual comments. Emails received. All right, I'll bring it back to the table then for discussion or questions. Mr. Mayor? Yes, Mr. Resnick. We did uh, quite a bit of extensive t talk about this recently and got a lot of good answers. And we're all looking forward to next steps. And I appreciate that you have, uh, you know, if, if this, then that. If that, then this. And that's the world that you live in. It sounds like <laughs> a continuation of, uh, you know, COVID times. If that, then this, then this, and that. But, um, yeah, we're all looking. Uh, Five Flags is very important to us. I have a of course, a soft spot for the theater, wonderful theater, and uh, uh, you continue to do great work uh, in that. I appreciate the story uh, that you have about how we've really come back and with our uh, the, the great management and uh, a lot of our, our Dubuque uh, citizens who worked there really brought it back. And I appreciate the citizens going down there and supporting our theater. And uh, so uh, again, thank you. Thank you, HR, and uh, thanks to citizens to bring us back in, uh, for, for live entertainment. We're ready. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Resnick. Well, I don't have any other questions yet. We've, we've talked a lot about this already, so a lot of questions answered, but um, thank you for the great work. I mean, this is something we should really be proud of. I know we're talking about some major changes potentially coming our way, um, but the fact that um, we have so much that gets accomplished at Five Flags is, is just something to be very proud of. So thank you for everyone who's a part of that. All right. Well, then, um, with that, we will move on to our next uh, public hearing. And I think you're just going to put one slide up on the screen there. OK, so yeah. So Grand River Center um, is our next one. We have one improvement package requested, and that improvement package is recommended. Thank you, Mayor. Mm -hmm. uh, again, my name is Marie Ware. I'm the Leisure Services Manager for the City of Dubuque. And I'm pleased to uh, talk again tonight about a Grand River Center, a source of great pride for our community. Grand River Center and Five Flags are operated just a little differently. They're both with management companies. However, the arrangement, the agreement with each is different. So with the Grand River Center, um, for the first time this year, we have actually um, put part of my time, a portion of my salary within this budget because I do spend a tr uh, quite a bit of time with it. So that is um, one of the pieces that also, I've always had the oversight, but now we're actually putting the financial part in there as well. The city of Dubuque does provide that oversight. We do own the Grand River Center building, that is ours, and we do the capital improvements funding there as well. We take care of the property and general liability insurance, and then we also pay 50% of the gas and electric as a part of the agreement we have with Platinum Hospitality. Platinum Hospitality is our management company with Mitzi Yorty as the general manager. They take care of the day-to-day -day operations. They pay the other 50% of gas and electric. Um, they pay building and repairs and maintenance under 1,184. And so we will pay that, whatever is over that, then that, those bills belong to the city. And then they pay all of the other remaining operating expenses. So that private business takes on that as their budget. Um, they also receive, um, from a revenue side, they receive 25% of the hotel motel tax generated by the Grand Harbor. Um, so in fiscal year 19, because we were like, well, what is that based upon the pandemic? So in fiscal year 19, that was $79,343. Um, and in 20, it uh, dropped to 74,571, and in 21, 73,967. So there was a drop, um, and we expect that that likely, obviously with the tourism returning, we've seen, especially with bring, spring break, a lot of people starting to return to our community. So I would assume that that would then start to move back up again. In prior year highlights for the Grand River Center, they also welcomed a lot of postponed groups and organizations uh, that came back. They are reporting that there are some that are still choosing not to be able to uh, come back yet, um, but then there's others that are starting to either come back fully um, or they're also continuing to do more of a hybrid version. And so one of the things that's a great highlight for the center is that um, the um, 
With the city's partnership with IMON, that's brought high-speed fiber connection, which enhances that fiber, um, those fiber formats. And so, um, as a prime example, this week we actually had the Iowa Parks and Recreation Association here. And there were many speakers that came in person and presented during the conference. But for an example, the IPERS representative um, did their entire presentation to us here, interactive, and they were in Des Moines in their office. And so they were able to actually do that presentation. They weren't here in person, but still provide all the same information through that hybrid format, and it worked very well. As we look at future initiatives for Grand River Center, um, in 2023, Grand River Center will be 20 years old. For many people, it still looks new. They feel like it's new. But really, in 2023, we hit 20 years. What that means is there's a lot of different, and what you see is there's a number of different assessments that we're talking about. So at the 20 to 25 year mark, it's kind of the time for a replacement cycle on many of the mechanical systems for the building. And so the market study and facility assessment is to look at two different items. So to be able to really look at those mechanicals and, and say, okay, what do we have help for us to be able to budget for the future um, and knowing what the appropriate amounts are and lifespan of some of our um, major mechanical systems. The assessment will include system upgrades, replacements. Um, they'll also look um, in another part of it at the, um, like are there things necessary that we haven't updated? The city's been really good and you've been really good of allocating funding so that People comment all the time about how nice it looks. It always looks very um, brand new, the new carpets, some new paint jobs that we do. So all of that is the cosmetic side. But there's the other side of it where we, have to, we haven't done the bathrooms. And so is it time to look at that? Have things changed in the way that um, bathroom facilities are handled? Um, also in the back of house, um, which is obviously the kitchen areas and the custodial areas and some of those, are there improvements that need to be made to some of those? And then also looking from a market study perspective as what are the other competing facilities doing? What are the things that maybe we need to do? We've done some of the upgrades with wireless systems and things like that, but maybe there's other things that are coming out of you know, the hybrid or that may continue on that make it that we should um, think about investing in some of those things. We'll also have a management and operations assessment, and this assessment is really to just look at how we've been doing with our management and operations, how we be able to, how we look to the future of what that should look like for us. The business has changed quite a bit in the last 20 years. There's still the standards, but like what is the mix um, between all of the different um, groups and and uh, and. Uh, groups and events that are held there. So being able to look at um, what's the best value for um, the guests, what about capacities, all those kinds of things will be looked at during that um, piece of a study. And then the City Council also, um, because of um, your priority on Grand River Center operations, um, the former two studies, as well as we'll be looking to do an RFP for management services um, and open it up so that uh, Platinum Hospitality will still be able to put in a proposal and be a part of the active part of that process, but if there's any others that are interested potentially in doing that, um, so that we can make sure we have the most competitive environment for our citizens um, for the operations of the center. And also in the future, we'll continue to look at building the business back up at Grand River Center. Um, some of the, as I said, some of the um, associations uh, are not still doing the in-person. Like I said, my association just did this week and we were here in Dubuque. Um, but uh, Mitzi has reported that there are some that are just still holding off one more year um, for a lot of different reasons and each have their own reasons. They're still looking to come back, um, but we haven't quite bounced back in, um, in all events and activities. The Grand River Center has a property tax support of $11.06. And when we look at improvement packages, we'll be um, doing some security cameras, and that would be in the back of house and the back dock area. That system currently is an old DVR system, and so 
all of you know, DVRs are kind of getting a little old. <laughs> so it's time to be able to get that actually on our, on our city systems and make it a part of um, all of the things that um, we're connected into versus being its own standalone system. When it comes to capital improvements for Grand River Center, um, we are always on a replacement schedule. And so we typically always look at doing our carpeting and our fabric wall coverings. Um, they don't always align because we'll replace a carpet twice a lot of times before we do the wall covering. So we're back to looking at those um, and making sure that we update uh, those. A major uh, project, because you probably look at the total for the chairs, tables, and podiums, a major project that we need to do once again at that 20-year mark is it, it, there's a um, 3,000 chairs, you know, all the chairs it takes to set all those different rooms that we have. And in order to be able to do just one chair, it's about $100. So you times that by 3,000 chairs, that takes a, a lot of funding. And so even all of this does not replace just the chairs alone. And as you can imagine, with the use that we get, um, the tables and the podiums at times have to be replaced. So that's what this funding does. The concrete restoration that we have there is within the exhibit hall. This specific one is within the exhibit hall uh, kind of by where the concession stand area is. So most of it is carpeted, but over there we'll fill some cracks and be able to put on an epoxy cover over the top and be able to color it and so it'll look a little nicer than what it also, so it'll do two things. It upgrades it and makes it look a lot better than it does right now. And so with that, I'll answer any questions you have. All right, thank you, Maureen. We'll open for public comment first, please. At this time, anyone participating in the meeting in person who would like to discuss this public hearing may approach the podium when the mayor asks if there is any in-person input for this public hearing. For all remote attendees, please enter your name and address in the chat function and state your question, or state your name and address over the phone when the mayor asks if there is any virtual input for this public hearing. Please begin your input by stating your name and address. All right, thank you, Adrian. Do we have any public comment for the Grand River Center? Anybody virtually? No virtual comments. All right. No emails received. All right. Thank you. Bring it back to the table for discussion then. Once again, I think you may have covered it. <laughs> that's great. Yeah. That's, that's two for three right there. So we'll see how it goes on the next one, right? Yeah. No, thank, thank you very much. Um, you know, I have to say it, it, was, it was a pleasure to join your um, organization for the, the association uh, yesterday for lunch and uh, a quick address. And it was nice to see people in the room again. It, it's just great to see people coming back. Uh, it, it is a beautiful facility still 20 years later, and it's great to be uh, able to enjoy it again. So thank you very much for all the work there. Thank you. And I would say um, the comments that, that um, I received from our participants, and they would be similar to others. It's so close to so many things. We can walk places. Um, they went to the Millwork District. They went to the casino. Some went to downtown. And so they were kind of all over uh, because of recreation people. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they found recreation. That's good. They found good. recreation. Excellent. Well, wonderful. Well, thank you very much for the presentation. Mm -hmm. So your final presentation this evening, but the third one for us, is the Mystique Community Ice Center. We have uh, no improvement packages requested um, specifically for this one, but I know we have quite a bit more to talk about there. So I'll let you take it away. Thank you. Thank you. Marie Ware, uh, Leisure Services Manager for the City of Dubuque. Um, this is the first time I've presented on the Mystique Community Ice Center. There's a lot of things that have happened in the last few months. So as a little bit of background, just to take us back a little bit before we go forward. In June of 21, Dubuque Community Ice and Recreation, also known as DICE, um, gave the city notice that they wanted to relinquish their leaseholder rights. And so during the time frame between June and August, due to the agreements that we had that um, the city signed into, along with the DRA and DICE and Battlefield, which is now called um, Northern Lights Hockey, better known as the Saints, if you want to think of it that way, they executed an agreement back in 2000, or several agreements actually, in 2009 that laid out if this happened, what would go on. And those agreements laid out a pecking order, so then if DICE decided they no longer wanted to run it, it would be offered to the DRA. They would have 30 days to decide. They declined. It was offered to Northern Lights Hockey, um, and that was the same. 
And so then, uh, who's at the end? That's the city. And so we then had to um, start preparing to be able to take over those operations. Um, DICE did inter enter into an interim management agreement with us to run the facility through September 5th to give us a little bit of time to get it turned over and taken over as a city operation. And so on December 5th, they were done at midnight and at midnight and one second of December 6th, it became a city operation. Additionally then, we took another step and as of January 1st, 2022, we have an interim staffing agreement where the Dubuque Racing Association or DRA um, became uh, the, the staffing, um, they, they are staffing the facility as a part of the um, management agreement or the staffing agreement, excuse me. And so we then transitioned. So those employees went from being DICE employees to city employees, and we transitioned them to DRA employees now. And all the while, the Mystique Community Ice Center functioned. There was not a day that we were closed. We did all of that seamlessly, so the skating public really didn't know. So the way it's set up right now is that the city of Dubuque has operations oversight, uh, and that's myself. The building is owned by the city. The capital improvement funding is the city's, and the operational funding is ours. The DRA is uh, with the staffing, and so they take care of that, which then, because of the staffing, they're doing day-to-day -day operations. All of the budget is still ours. They're doing things on our behalf, and we're communicating all the time related to that. Chad Rimmickle is a general manager um, until the end of the month, and then um, he is moving on and we'll have a new general manager. So I had to really give kudos, and I think this is really important if you, um, in this short period of time, in order to do what we did to be able to take over a facility and make sure that everyone could keep skating and that there was no disruption of service, it took a lot of people. And so this is our spirit statement for the city of Dubuque. And I felt like this was the best way to express this. It took teamwork, teamwork on a whole lot of different levels in order to move this mountain. And so um, the DICE staff, the, the staff that we then moved over with Chad in that leadership position became those city employees. Didn't miss a beat, they worked with us really well. It wasn't, you know, they transitioned over and they just kept doing their job. They were getting a paycheck and, and all this from somebody else, but they just kept doing what needed to be done in the facility. When it came to the city departments, you see the list there. It took the majority of city departments to be able to make this transition and, uh, and keep that going as we go along. And so I was working with people in every department that you see listed there and saying, okay, how can we do this? We need to get this done, we need this permit, we need this inspection. Um, how do we get the people turned over? And everybody really pitched in. We have such an excellent team here at the city. And then they also embraced those staff because they were working for a nonprofit and now all of a sudden they're working for a city and they operate very differently. And so everybody just kind of rolled with the punches and really um, helped in the transition in any way they can. And I'm very thankful for every single department and every single person that helped make that happen. And particularly the leisure services staff, because I've been absent from a lot of things in helping to do this. And so there's a lot of coverage that's happened or when I needed help, I'm like, can you help do this? Can you help do this? Can you help do this? And they all stepped up to the charge. Now, why did we do this and why is this very important? This building is so important because I think a lot of people don't know how many different ICE user groups there really are. If you're not an ICE um, enthusiast, you may not know. But we have Dubuque Youth Hockey Association and so a lot of, um, a lot of young people that are uh, a part of that association. Dubuque Figure Skating is there. The high school has a competitive team that plays there. University of Wisconsin, Platteville has a, a competitive team that plays there. There's two that, um, that are on the other end of the spectrum here with the Fossils and the Senior Saints that also skate there. Um, of course, it's very well known for our Dubuque Fighting Saints, uh, and so they also are um, 
part of our uh, tenants that, that are a part of this facility. And then the other part is just that open skate, the opportunity for people to be able to go, to learn, or now we're also seeing rentals or we're seeing groups come in. Um, this is kind of the time of year you start to see school groups coming. And so the DRA staff is working very hard to be able to bring more school groups there, get more kids introduced to skating in, um, in our facility. So the future initiatives, as we look at our future, what is important for us to do, we're working on and meet weekly with the DRA staff to go over the current operations. So we talk about what, how's it going, what's going on, what do we need to troubleshoot, uh, you know, celebrate successes. And really kind of the other part of that is, is then also discussing what this new future of the center looks like. Not where we've been, but where are we going to go? Where is this going to take us into the future? And how can we make this ICE Center a really great place and is such a sense of pride, even more so than it is for our community? And then also because um, this is important because the City Council has said Chapman Schmidt Island and all of its parts are a very important priority for us. And the Mystique Ice Center is a part of the Chapman Schmidt Island. We've had many great conversations about how we move together for a successful future for the island as well. How does the ice center integrate with the um, new uh, possibilities for the island? I thank Alex Dixon, the um, CEO of, of Q Casino and his team uh, because we've been having these great conversations and meetings about where we can potentially take this and what we can do with it. And so they've also been great to work with on this staffing transition and bringing their expertise and problem solving and can do attitude. And I really appreciate that. Um, that, helps a partner, that helps to set a partnership on the right um, foot right off to the start. So we're on the road and the other piece to this then is the capital improvements. And I'll be talking about those in a little bit. And as I said, the other uh, future initiative that's really important is that we'll be getting a new leader, a new general manager, and it'll be up to them to introduce that um, when they're ready. The property tax support, um, so it's a 200,000 uh, operating expense, um, so that's $2.97 for, uh, for the average um, homeowner. So what's coming up in the capital improvements? So as you're aware, um, the Mystique Ice Center has been settling. So we did a, a small project, a small remediation project, and that was already completed. So we took some areas that were really in desperate need of taking care of. Um, and so uh, for an example, there was an emergency exit where the, the concrete, it hadn't broken, it just had settled, and there was a trip hazard of about this much. And so when you think about that, that's a pretty good trip hazard. And so what we were able to do is to raise that concrete back up in that remediation project. Now what we need to be able to do is to really look at the entire facility because we just did specific areas there um, and we didn't do anything with where the ice is actually at. And so it's not like it's not doing anything underneath the ice. It's just that um, we focused on the areas that we could in the remediation to begin with. And um, let's see, so the part of this project is the foundation settlement and making sure we get that. The ice rink floor systems will all have to be removed and replaced, a concrete subfloor under the ice, and then ice built back in. There's dasher boards that go around the facility and so those would be removed and replaced um, because as this settlement happens, there's this bending obviously that happens. So not everything is gonna be square as we kind of take it out. And if you try and put together again, something that's not real square, it's just not gonna work real well. And so, um, so that's also part of that. Uh, the time frame for this is a, is a very quick turnaround. What we wanna be able to do, and it's very important in order to keep the, the Typically, they skate all year long, but we're taking the lesser used time in order to be able to do the facility closure. So our bidding processes, what you'll see is at your next council meeting, you'll see those bidding processes start um, and work their way through during the time frame there between April 4th and May 16th. And the facility will be closed from June 1st to August, or October, not August, October 31st. 
Um, and so that will create a little bit of a delay in what usually is the beginning of the season. They'll have to play out um, like um, at other locations for their games. They'll play away games a lot of times. And there may be some ice rentals that some of the groups have to do over the summer for things that they might have done typically. So in other improvements that are also uh, recommended as a part of the CIP, a generator. A generator can perform several functions. One is to protect the ice during power outages or when um, there's peak interrupts. So as we know, we've had some summers where it gets so hot that large users, there's an interrupt that goes on. Um, we have not used that interrupt, which would be an energy savings, um, or not a uh, cost savings, because if you use the energy interrupt, depending upon how long they have it off, you could lose your ice. And it's very expensive to put your ice back in. You really need to protect that ice. And so a generator could help in that as one of the ways um, in order for us to be able to have a lower priced energy cost. The center's dehumidification. Um, it has been found that this, the current system is undersized. And what that means is when it's undersized, that means that all the other systems have to work harder because there's too much humidity in the air. If, you ever, if you've ever been there uh, when the building is pretty full, sometimes the ice, you'll start to see it, um, that it starts to degrade just a little bit. And there are certain standards that we have to keep um, with U USHL hockey for the ice quality because of safety. And so this is a very, very important thing that we get this upgraded. It also will reduce some of our energy costs because we have all of that back of the house equipment working three times as hard to try and keep up when you, that dehumidification system is not able to do it. Additionally, because we live by the river down there, that humidity is even higher. So on any given day, you've got that whole water source there that's putting off a lot of, uh, a lot of humidity. And so um, it's even uh, more pronounced down in that area. From a safety perspective, we have several um, things that we need to upgrade. There needs to be a hard surface walk because of fire code that goes out of one of the emergency exits and goes to the parking lot. So in other words, if you were exiting out of that right now, you would just go on the grass. Well, that doesn't work from an ADA perspective for other people or for people that have other um, walking um, that well for safety. So, um, so that's one of the pieces of that. Um, also, currently where the Zamboni sits, um, be, the drainage does not. So they come off the ice. They have that shaved ice that comes off with them, and then a lot of times it sits right in the middle of the walkway that goes underneath the bleachers there, creating a very um, unsafe environment for staff or anybody else that has to traverse through that area because it's not tipped in the right way. So what we need to be able to do is to create it so that it drains appropriately back to the Zamboni Bay um, and take care of that safety issue. We're also looking at um, not only the safety side of things, but we're also looking at the uh, revenue side of the world too, with some concessions improvements. I can tell you after working in the concession stand, it is not set up well to make money. There's too many steps, there's too many different things that have to happen. Um, it doesn't make for a good flow and also just from a service perspective. If you think about places you've been recently and, and some of the concession stand you've been at, where it's like the flow goes very quickly, there's a lot of little things you can do within the design of a concession stand to make it so that it's a better revenue production area for you. Um, and some of this will also be to upgrade some of the concessions equipment because it hasn't been upgraded since it was built um, and is beyond useful life. Uh, but again, this is so that we can increase revenues um, to the facility. And the last item is a mechanical systems assessment. So the facility is 11 years old, and again, it's that time to really look at those mechanical systems and be able to look at the life cycles, the replacements, um, how are they, how have they done, um, and, the, and that will help us to be able to budget better for the future of what our replacements are for the ICE Center since we have not been running it. The way the agreements were set up is that the entire operation, all the capital and everything was the responsibility of DICE. And so it's a little different than our buildings in that 
I kind of keep track of what's going on at Grand River Center in Five Flags. I kind of know what the ages of things are. I know which parts are working well, and I know which parts are not working well, um, especially from all those mechanicals. And so this allows us to be able to get on the books a real good assessment of where everything's at so that we can provide much better budgeting for the future, as well as they'll look at, are there any things we can do outside of what we've already talked about? Um, they're also actually assisting with some of this dehumidification that goes with the one capital improvement um, to be able to look at that sizing and things like that. So that's what this um, particular assessment is all about. And so with that, that's a whole lot in a quick amount of time. So then I'll try and answer any questions you have. All right. Thank you very much, Marie. We'll go to public comment first, please. At this time, anyone participating in the meeting in person who would like to discuss this public hearing may approach the podium when the mayor asks if there is any in-person input for this public hearing. For all remote attendees, please enter your name and address in the chat function and state your question or state your name and address over the phone when the mayor asks if there is any virtual input for this public hearing. Please begin your input by stating your name and address. Okay. Do we have any? Oh, Mr. Dixon, I see you right there. Yeah. I wasn't looking up. <laughs> yes. Uh, good evening, everyone, uh, Mr. Mayor and uh, council uh, people. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Alex Dixon, uh, 251 Hidden Oaks Court, Dubuque, Iowa. I think the first time I've ever said it publicly, so uh, it's, it's, it's great to be here. Uh, I also serve as the, the CEO of the Dubuque Racing Association, the DRA, uh, Q Casino, and uh, proud uh, staffing agreement manager of the, uh, the ICE Center. Uh, first, on behalf of our now new employees at the ICE Center, I want to thank you all for considering uh, this, this budget item. Uh, the Mystique ICE Center is a vital um, po portion of our community. Uh, the ICE user groups, uh, the kids, uh, as I like to call them, uh, are, are very fortunate to have a facility of this nature, and it's uh, vitally important that we continue to invest uh, not only in this facility but in the island. And uh, we're grateful, and I want to thank uh, Marie, your entire staff, and, and all the departments of the, uh, of the city that we've come to know intimately well. Um, who helped to keep this get this going. Uh, it's sometimes it's tough to see a big uh, number like this, but um, the only difference between Marie and I and the facilities that we run and manage are that we have a couple slot machines uh, in our facility, but we've got the same, same capital needs. And so um, thank you for your consideration of this, and uh, we look forward to strengthening our relationship with you so that we can uh, sell more popcorn with the concessions improvements that uh, we're contemplating, as well as the year-round uh, operation. It is uh, vitally important for Schmidt Island, and uh, thank you again for your consideration. Thank you for your comments. Good evening, Council. My name is Beth Remical. I live at 16888 Cherrywood Hills. And I definitely want to commend Marie and her staff. I'm sure Marie never knew all this took, all this took place behind the scenes when you drive by this, the Mystique Center. Um, I'm actually a third generation skater. I started skating at Floor Park and warmed up in the Red Barn. Um, my children are involved in skating, and yes, Chad is my son, and my daughter is the president of youth hockey. Um, I've coached, I've been on the board, um, I've, I've been at the rink a long time. Five Flags, um, I actually helped build the rink, the Mystique rink. I was down there one summer every day after work, put bleachers together, put all the piping under the ground, so it's very disheartening for me to see this awful number that we have to spend to put this rink back together. We fundraised and we had you know, all the money we needed to build a rink when I was fundraising for 20 years. Um, we had planned to build a rink that was self-sufficient, 500 seats. Um, obviously, that morphed into what we have today. Definitely a much better product than what our little youth hockey would have managed. But again, I'm fully supporting um, this horrible big number that we have to have, but it's very well worth the, the community's um, contribution to, you know, we've had tournaments, we, those people come, 
they spend money at the hotels, they spend money at restaurants. Um, so again, thank you council for consideration of this big ticket item. Thank you, Ms. Remickle, for your comments. Any other public comments here in chambers? How about virtually? No virtual comments. Okay. Adrian? There has been written input received. I'm just going to name off the individuals and their addresses if they have provided it. Shelby White, 15402 Woodvale Court. Brian Ellers, 3025 North Grandview. Linda Zick, 1620 South Grandview. Tasha Lippold, 2545 Willowbrook Brook Drive. Alan Temperley, 2955 St. Anne Drive. Stephanie Fuger, Allison White, 1800 Admiral Sheehy Drive. Corey Meehan, 2523 Broadway Street. Cody Nemers, Sarah Baveau, 3150 Hales Mill Road. Angela Poles, 3559 Eclipse Circle. Janin Steffs, Tyler, no last name provided, 2715 Windsor Ave. Lisa Moore and Sarah Hill, 20275 Cruise Lane. All of this input has been included with the agenda item. All right, thank you, Adrian. I'll bring it back to the table then for discussion and questions. Ms. Mr. Barber. Mary, I wanted to uh, just follow up with Adrian uh, has mentioned, and I think I responded by email to all of those individuals who had contacted um, us, and I just want to give them a shout out um, for the communication and for the support of the ice rink and for uh, these were very wonderful, wonderful um, emails that they summarized their families, just like Beth had done, uh, their history um, with ice, whether it's youth hockey or ice skating, or even some of the Fighting Saints alum uh, that we support even today. So I was just greatly appreciated and touched by their outreach, and um, I look very much forward to supporting this program. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Mayor. Uh, Mr. Jones, yeah. I have to apologize. <clears throat> Excuse me. I have to apologize to some of the people that communicated with us yesterday. I couldn't keep up. <laughs> had to prep for a budget hearing last night. Had to prep for a budget hearing tonight. Had to go to work. Had to do the other things of life. And I, I pride myself on trying to answer City Dubuque emails, um, particularly when I agree with the person who's writing. And they were numerous. Um, I've not seen a constituency come forward in support of a city project like this in a in a long, long time. So that was pretty neat. And of course we have to fix it. Um, I, I don't like how we ended up owning and operating it. I love that the DRA has stepped up to, to help. Um, I love that we're gonna have some enhancements and make it a better place for the island. Um, but of course we have to fix it. Um, you don't take a facility like that and just let it crumble into disuse. Um, that's not who we are or what we are. So I support that and, and I apologize to the folks today didn't get back to and thank for their correspondence yesterday. Thank you. Mr. Sprank. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And Marie, thank you. Um, I feel like your shoulders aren't big enough for all the things <laughs> that we keep giving to you. So thank you. Um, this was, uh, I, look at, I look at this as a project of when you buy a house that you didn't build, you didn't design, you just, there were things that you that the, that happens, so we have to fix it now. Um, and to echo a lot of what my cohorts have said, we I, this has been. I was amazed at the number of emails. I couldn't get to them all today, but yesterday I was trying to keep up the best I could. And and all the support, the family stories, the connection that people really want to keep this place up and running. And I, for one, definitely intend to because it's an investment in the community, and it's an investment in Chapel and Schmidt Island. So, thank you. Thank you. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Resnick. Thank you very much. So um, there's a, a lot of support, obviously, um, for a year-round operation uh, at ICE. And there's a lot of support out there for a four-season athletic facility, too. They wish they could have that. We live in Dubuque, Iowa, hot summers and cold winters. And, and yet people want to be active for uh, you know all four seasons. So I, I, I appreciate that. The only th the main thing I get from some uh, people is six point six million dollars. Is that a recurring cost? I hear. <laughs> no, and I know that, but they just don't want this. You know the settlement and all that. Uh, they know that when we do work, we do it well, and they're surprised that you know short time later, 10, 11 years, we have this issue. And of course, we have to fix it, but we sure don't want to fix it again. So, could you tell us? What steps are being taken to, to, to 
to say that, well, we're fixing it and we're fixing it right. We're not going to need to do this again for a long time. Sure. Um, I'll do my best to do that, not being the engineer in the room. But um, uh, Assistant City en Engineer Bob Schizel is has been assigned to the project to, uh, to assist and to help lead it. And so is he in the room? Oh, yeah, he's here. So um, if you ask me too technical, the expert's back there. Um, but what we've done is um, we've uh, talked to settlement experts. And so we had one group in to do the preliminary um, settlement remediation, um, very much experts in their field. Um, it, you know, when you watch them do their work, they know what they're doing. Um, additionally, we had reached out to other firms that did the same sort of work early on, and um, we mostly being um, Bob doing the majority of that work, reached out to them. They came to the facility. They looked at what was going on. Each of them might come at it at a little different angle about how they do it, um, but yet we've got, it's not just one person or one firm that's come and look at this, looked at this facility to be able to kind of get an idea of what's the right thing to be able to do. And I think um, I've heard him say from all of them, yes, this happens, and it's not unusual. Facilities settle. These things happen in different places. We use these methods in a lot of different buildings, and it's been successful for us to use these methods. Um, and so that's, um, you know, that helps an awful lot. Um, and the building was designed in a specific way. And so one of the things that will happen is some of the things that were not in that design would be changed up as we made these, um, as we made these improvements. And so we really are trying to make sure, I mean, because even for us, if we're going to spend this kind of money, we've got to do it right. We've got to do it right, and we've got to make sure this is going to be a good solution that's going to take us into the future. We don't want to come back to it either. And so the key has been really trying to engage people in, in different um, uh, expertises. Um, so like I said, when we're talking about the settlement, we've got people that are engaged in that. Um, and those structural engineers that really, um, because we're working with a structural engineer on it as well. So they're overseeing it as well, because um, we want to make sure we have that expertise that's at the table. The demidification system, we've got those experts that are looking at that piece of it. So we really are trying to bring in those um, particular firms that have the expertise to make sure we're making the best, best decisions and long-term decisions for us. Thank you. And, uh, you know, sometimes when, like, the parking garage goes bad or there's other things that we can name, we can say that is responsible, the, that company is responsible, and they kick in for the repair. And uh, I guess there was a frustration. It's like, well, the citizens of Dubuque aren't responsible for that, whatever happened there. Why are we paying? Are, is there going to be some kind of um, way to put it on the line that the, the builders are responsible for the work they do, or is it, is it a, a, a 10 year, we hope we get 10 years out of it? I'm going to have Bob answer that one just so it's answered appropriately. Good evening. Assistant City Engineer Bob Schizzle. Um And I'd like to reiterate that, that uh, the settlement remediation approach that we're taking will be a permanent, a permanent fix. Um, I don't want to you know, spoil all the fun because I have some stuff in my presentation to come here a little bit later. But uh, um, we are going to be looking at doing some deep, some deep foundation remediation work. So we go down real deep and stabilize the soils to support um, this lab. Now, um, the specifications that we're putting together are going to um, specify a, a quarter inch of settlement um, over the duration of the improvements that we're going to be making. So, um, you know, the, the, and, and we will also have, have uh, um, our standard two-year maintenance, um, you know, performance workmanship uh, type, type guarantee with the projects as well. So um, we are putting the appropriate teeth in the contract, so to speak, uh, to ensure that it's, that it's done right. Thank you very much. I'm sure a lot of people uh, will appreciate hearing that. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. 
Yeah, Ms. Roussel. Thank you. I think what I've learned from all of Marie's presentations throughout this budget process is that leisure services equals quality of life. And it's a little something for everyone. And this is something that I was not really familiar with. So as with all of my colleagues, I really appreciated the input from the citizens who let me know why this facility is so important, how their family uses it, all of the economic impact that maybe we don't think about. So I just wanted to say thanks to Marie and thanks to all the citizens that reached out to us to help educate us. That's the kind of information that we don't get in the budget presentation. So thanks for taking time to do that. Thank you. Mr. Mayor? Yeah, um, Mike, go ahead. Thank you. Um, I would just like to mention that Marie showed in her presentation her teamwork slide and showed a lot of members of the team, and some of them are here tonight, like the DRA and youth hockey. Um, but uh, to have a good team, you have to have a good manager. And uh, if anybody went to a hockey game this year, you might have seen somebody serving hot dogs that looked a lot like Marie Ware. <laughs> And so Marie Ware did everything she possibly could to make this thing work this year. And I'm confident she's doing everything she can do now to get us through this next stage and make it continue to work. But uh, um, it was a surprise project for her, but uh, she stepped right up. Yeah. Thank you, Mike. And thank you, Marie. You know, I, uh, I, People who know me for a long time know that I actually come from a hockey family, you know, so I actually, um, you know, hockey's sort of a part of what I think Dubuque is in a lot of ways. And that's a lot of the, the message that we got from a lot of the people who are, who are sending us messages today. And I really appreciate that. And I, I especially appreciated some of the things they said about other people who come from out of, outside of Dubuque to play hockey or, or use the ice here in, in Dubuque. Just talk about how great the Mystique is and, and how wonderful it is of a place to, to be able to visit. Um, but, but that's actually not the reason that I want to support this um, because, you know, hockey is, is really important to Dubuque. The ice is really important for us to have here for the families and the quality of life of people who are living right here. But in so many ways, and, and this is something I really want to drive home with people, this is, is very similar to the Five Flags discussion. This is an economic development driver in the same way that Five Flags is. When you talk about hockey, you don't just talk about the game, you talk about what goes on before the game. People go out to eat, they come from out of town, they use the restaurants here, some of them stay here. A lot of them after the game will go over to the queue. They use the, the amenities on Schmidt Island and other places within the city. Um, and that's just talking about things like the Fighting Saints games. Now when you talk about youth hockey, you talk about tournaments, you talk about families coming in. There are many, many people that are coming to Dubuque just for this purpose. It's an absolute investment that we must make to be able to keep it shiny and new as we can. And, and what I'm hearing from you is that this is going to be an incredible upgrade in many ways to what we've already been used to. I do have a question, because I think it's an important one to ask, too, about, um, you know, this is a new line for us, a new expense line to have to deal with. As far as funding streams go, do we have opportunities ahead of us to be able to access um, grant dollars and things like that to be able to, to help to fund this? It, it's a big number. It's hard to swallow. Um, it's a new number for us to have to deal with. Are there ways that we're going to be able to work with this in the ways that we've worked with other big projects before? Um, currently, to my knowledge, uh, there's not like a grant funding source that would um, be able to do this part. If we were building it new, then community attractions and tourism. But when you're doing kind of this um, fix problems mm -hmm. approach, um, the, that's not something that grant funding sources really um, look at very kindly. So um, now, if there's other things in our future, um, potentially at the ICE Center, we'll always, as you know, as a staff, we will always be on the hunt. So if there's ever something out there to sniff out, actually, um, I was speaking with uh, Terry Goodman just this afternoon about would, would this or this work for the island? Would this or this potentially? And so we're always in those conversations looking for what, what might meet our new needs. So the ICE Center itself and this current project, I don't see that, that, um, that there's anything out there. If there is, we'll find it. Um, but mostly because it's a, a repair job versus some new amenity that we're, or, or an add-on or anything like that. Um, but we will continue to look for anything that relates to it or the entire island or connecting to the island. Mm -hmm. um, it, we're already 
you know, looking at that because of the, um, the priority that you've placed on it. We're already having those conversations and looking at what else is there to be able to help us achieve the goals that we want to achieve, your goals. Yeah. Great. So this really does fit into the category of just it's an important investment of our tax dollars to have to do this for the community. Yes. Okay. All right. Yes. Wonderful. Well, thank you for that information. Any other thoughts or discussion? All right, then. Well, thank you very much for your presentations tonight, Marie. We, we really appreciate all the information. Thank you. So we will switch over now to transportation services. So we'll let that uh, group get set up and then we'll get rolling. It's good. Watching. It's good. Yeah. Oh, we're glad to have you. Um, All right. Going on our next one here. So we have transportation services. Um, we have three improvement packages requested, all of which are recommended. So Ryan, welcome. And we'll let you get started. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor, City Council, City Manager. Um, I'm Ryan Nucky, the Director of Transportation Services. Tonight, I have the honor of going through the 2023 budget presentation for transportation services, which includes the Jewel Transit and our parking division. I'll figure out how to run this. Our mission statement is very clear. We want to provide transit and parking services in the city of Dubuque for citizens and visitors, connecting people to the employment, services, school, and recreation that are safe, accessible, consistent, and professional. And I will touch on most all of those topics tonight. Um, I'm very fortunate. I stepped into a very, very solid team. Um, our transfer service, trace, transportation services department, we have 53.21 full-time equivalents. That is 22 full-time employees and 56 part-time employees. Um, I am the new tr director of transportation services. I'm, I'm very fortunate to have Russ Steckline as the operations supervisor for parking. Jody Johnson is back as operations supervisor for transit and Jake Ironside is our transportation analyst. Um, I do uh, agree with the fire chief the other night that this should be flipped over because we, it's our job as the department to support our team members so that they can support the community. Um, we will touch on full-time employees later throughout the slides. You will note that we do have a transportation advisory board that we report through. Um, this board is man, made up of members from the city of Dubuque, Iowa. Um, this board helps us with things that they're hearing on the street, things that they see that we could improve. And on our side, we are reporting any FTA changes to this, this board, along with our numbers that we are currently running. So through the board and our great team that I currently have, we are trying to make Dubuque a community of choice through the parking and the transportation division. Um, we're going to work on doing that through resiliency, sustainability, equity, and compassion. Um, I have examples. These are some of the examples we're working on right now. Some are current state, some are future state. Uh, resiliency, currently the Jewel staff is researching electric powered buses for a grant received. This project includes electric bus along with charging infrastructure. We are currently in the selection stage. Now Dubuque, Iowa is on a hill. So finding an electric bus to go up and down every day is, has been quite the challenge. Um, not only do we live on a hill, but we also have summers that are 100 degrees hot and winters that are 20 and 30 degrees cold. Um, we have actually sat down with multiple uh, providers already. We have not found a mix that fits our current set system yet. Um, we are including our maintenance division in this so that they have firsthand knowledge of what these buses can do and we can also budget for maintenance costs future state. Sustainability, the Jewel is collaborating with other departments on increasing ridership without increasing fleet size and costs. Equity, with the new infrastructure bill approved, the Jewel is looking for options on how to make our bus terminals and stops user friendly for the visually impaired. ADA technology has improved to enhance the experience for all visually impaired ADA riders. If you come to our terminals, they're very nice, they're very clean, um, very easy to function through. But as we did a review this year, and Jody Johnson did a great job with it, we are missing some key ADA improvements that we need. Currently, we're in the selection stage and looking at different ways we can do this with the current grant money we have. Um, as we move forward, we're definitely getting input from um, different departments that we work through. On the Compassion front, Dubuque Community School District now has the ability to apply for student bus passes online. 
since implementing the online application, there has been a 13% increase in active student passes. Prior years, students would have to come down to the intermodal facility. This would take time, it would take parents' time. Um, Jody Johnson did a great job, and we have all this online now. So the school systems can go online, provide that the students are active students in the school, and then with that, we'll process their application to get the students on the buses. Fiscal, fiscal year 2022 highlights. Uh, we did issue the RFP for smart parking. We have continual operations during the COVID-19 pandemic. School, student school bus passes application process is now online. We've restructured the department and appointed a new director. Implemented new Jewel Smart Pass system, fare collection, which is our gen fare system, which we have on all of our buses right now. We purchase and we have future delivery of five new Gillig heavy duty buses, which we're hoping will be here starting in May to June. Future initiatives. We definitely want to uh, update our bus stop and ADA improvements. Um, bus stop shelters and stop and, and stop lighted benches to be added. We definitely want to be integrating the electric buses like we discussed into our fleet. Again, we're in the selection phase right now. Very excited about it. But there are key things we're looking for, and one of those things is the low floor units. We want riders to have independence when they board our bus to do it by themselves so that they feel more empowered to do that. Along with that, the low floor allows for lower maintenance costs and also safety for the drivers and the riders. Equitable route expansion and service area review. Working with strategic partnerships, the de Department of Shared Prosperity and Neighborhood Support, along with the Greater Dubuque Development Corporation, we're working on figuring out where people need to be. I see Rick Dickinson's here tonight. Um, I sat down with his team and Jason White, and we're looking at how do we get employees to employers. Um, Greg Orwell from Do Rides here tonight. Um, he's been in these meetings on figuring out what's the best solution that we can do with our current situation, or what do we have to modify to move forward with this. The Smart Parking Initiative has commenced, currently interviewing potential consultants, and we are including community stakeholders in this input. We are making sure that we're getting input back from some of our, our bigger stakeholders in this so that their questions are getting answered as we go about this selection process. The Transit Division for FY23 is requesting a property tax support of $1,419,770 which equates to $21.06 per the average homeowner. Our parking division is requesting $0 of the net general fund property tax support. Our transit operations, I've broken this out in two different sections. Um, transit operations, the Jewel Transit Division manages fixed route and paratransit services, as well as maintenance and planning for transit vehicles, bus stops, and other capital infrastructure. This is comprised of three transfer locations, 15 bus shelters, over 280 bus stops, 13 light duty, four medium duty, and 12 heavy duty buses. I do wanna outline our current dual bus inventory. The FTA, we run under a lot of guidelines with them. We receive a lot of funding through the FTA. And they have a useful life parameter for buses. Now you can run the buses past the useful life. That is acceptable and, and we currently per the screen we are doing that. All the buses up on the screen that are showing in green are within the useful life of the FTA parameters. All the buses up on the screen in the orange color are outside of their, those parameters, meaning they have surpassed the years that the FTA uh, would like to see. When you get outside those years, we see a lot more maintenance cost. We see a lot more um, issues with, with overall structure but also, if you ride those buses, you hear the rattles, the creaks, the groans. The buses are getting wore down. They get a lot of miles. So that's why the FDA has these guidelines. We do have the five new Gillig buses that are coming on board, and that will greatly help, but we will still be short on the FTA guidelines. So the buses, the members, our, our transit board, and our team also partner with a lot of Dubuque sponsors, and we also have a lot of partnerships throughout Dubuque. Um, do rides here tonight, Mercy One we do a lot with, Medical Associates, um, and as I mentioned before, the Dubuque Community Schools we're working with heavily to make sure students are getting the rides they need. I know, Mr. Mayor, you said that city buildings don't need masks anymore. 
except if you come to the Jewel or the Intermodal. Um, FTA guidelines are, have extended their mask mandate through April 18th. Um, I know you're sad. I have 75, six employees that were very devastated by this. Um, it's another month. We'll get through it. The Jewel has done a great job on being proactive and to keep everyone safe. Um, routine cleaning, PPE for all staff, but we still require masks for all riders that ride our, our buses. For the transit review sources for FY23, we're looking at our revenue of $2,896,563. And our expenditures for FY23 are $4,117,241. This next slide shouldn't be any um, new thing for anybody. It is our historical ridership. And you will greatly see that from 2019 through 2021, we had a drastic decline in riders. Um, I do want to point out that our fixed route and our minibus saw pretty much the same type of decline, um, along with the do ride service that works with us. We're hoping with COVID-19, hopefully being on the back seat now, we can see these riders come back. Um, we are still seeing the majority of our riders um, that do like to use our services. They still really like our express <coughs> service. The express service runs from our intermodal building down off of Elm Street out to our west side uh, intermodal loop, which is the ARC building out there. That connects the downtown to the far side of town. And then from there, they can hop on another bus to get where they need to go in that area. One thing I do want to stress on this is our parish transit ridership. Um, although we've seen the decline, we are still doing the important rides for, for the, the needs. Um, we're still seeing a lot of medical rides, Dr doctor's visits, physical therapy. Um, we saw a big decline in the leisure services, going to the movies, shopping malls, um, any night out on the town. Now I want to discuss our parking operations. Um, the parking division provides and maintains ramp, service lot, and metered parking to support and encourage economic growth and address business and residential parking needs in the downtown area. The parking division enforces public parking related ordinances throughout the community. It's comprised of seven parking ramps, soon to be eight, 19 service lots, over 2,000 meters, and eight residential parking permit districts. The next slide shows, this is our current parking meter district. Um, this map outlines where our parking um, meters are throughout the area. We do have parking enforcement officers that do manage this area along with other areas of Dubuque um, to make sure that people are properly using them. Our FY23 revenue, we're looking at $5,255,421. Our FY23 expenses, we're looking at $5,100,124. Our parking statistics for 2021, um, we issued 20,428 tickets. Uh, total dollars from the tickets was $274,170. Um, Dubuque does give out courtesy tickets, first time offenders, out of state. Um, that was rated at 5,916 tickets written. Um, if somebody does get a ticket and they don't think they should be in a ticket, we do have an appeals process. Um, last year we had 457 appeals, 270 were approved, and 187 were denied. And the big part of parking this year is the Smart Parking RFP, which I touched on a little bit earlier. But the parking division um, is set to hire a consultant to scope a project and outline best practices for the city's ramps, surface lots, and on-street parking in the downtown and historic Millwork district to best suit a city of our size to include citizen and business needs, information systems, equipment needs, application, telecommunications, enforcement, and revenue projections. One thing I don't have up on the slide is flexibility. Um, we're moving into a new hybrid workforce. We have businesses that are back, but they're only back two, three, four days out of the week. It's not the normal nine to five, five days a week that we've seen before. So when this consultant comes in, we're definitely going to be reaching out to our stakeholders in the community, the citizens in the community, to get their input on, on what they need for this town. Um, we definitely want to make sure we're reaching out and getting references on, on these systems to move forward and, and to have an equitable community. We are asking for three uh, improvement requests. Uh, Mr. Mayor, on Monday night, 
I was here for that one too. Um, you did say we need to be ready for the infrastructure plan. Um, our first uh, improvement request would be $35,000 for a consultant service to, for our grant writing process. We've been working with Terry Goodman already. Um, FTA has already released some, a low-no grant that we want to be part of. Uh, it is due May 31st. And Terry, my team, have sat down with, with Seth, um, with Andy Seth, to outline what is needed for that. Our second improvement process is, like I stated before, we have 22 full-time, 56 part-time. We would like to have four full-time employee bus operators be in addition. Um, it's a reoccurring cost of $34,440, but that's to bring four full-time positions on. We would be reducing down the time slots for 15 part-time employees. And at the bottom, we have a non-reoccurring cost of $5,000 to support do-ride for the increased funding for operations due to COVID-19. For our transit division, our FY23 capital improvement projects, we're asking for $383,182 for transit vehicle replacement. You saw in the earlier slides, we're outside FTA on their useful vehicle timelines. We'd like to get back into that scenario, especially um, for, for the riders and their satisfaction on the buses. Um, and then another ask we're asking for is $10,250 for our bus stop improvements. This is gonna help with bus stop shelters, lighting, and any ADA requirements we need. For FY23 capital improvements for the parking division, we are asking for $68,000 for parking ramp condition assesses and main, a maintenance plan. This plan is for the Five Flags and Fifth Street ramp. Um, it is going to be our maintenance plan for the next one, two, five, ten years out. Um, we wanna make sure that we have the correct maintenance built in for these facilities so that these facilities stay maintained and we don't have a major emergency fund, funds needed. We have $2,348,822 for the new downtown parking ramp. We have $373,000 for our smart parking systems, which would be the smart parking RFP and mobility plan that was approved by council. We have $16,000 for the municipal parking lot maintenance. This maintenance is painting lines, cleaning up landscaping, and maintaining the, the lots that we have. Um, we have $82,931 for the Port of Dubuque ramp, ramp major maintenance. This is the ramp, the Diamond Joe ramp, most people call it as. As this maintenance goes on, most of these bills all get transferred to the Diamond Joe and they reimburse us for them. And then we have $245,000 for parking ramp major maintenance for the Iowa Street and the Locust Street ramps that was assessed during the last assessment that they were done. Performance measures, growing up I was not a fan of Facebook, now I love Facebook. Um, we are pushing Facebook, we are trying to get um, all riders onto Facebook. The big push for that is not only can we communicate quick and efficiently with them um, if there's a down bus or a delayed bus, but especially in the winter time when we have storms coming through, if we need to shorten schedules or change schedules, we're able to communicate that way also. Um, in the the other thing we look for is on the transit side, we want to make sure that our buses are where people are. So we try to make sure that we're within school distances, we're within um, where people live that are using our buses. Um, and the big push at the end is we want our ridership to go back up. Like I said, FY21, we're at 317,000. Um, we want, really want to push that to the 390 to 400,000 mark this year. Um, and community involvement will definitely be a, a big role in that. Um, transportation Services Department, for the parking side, we don't like to give out parking tickets, but it happens. It's our job to maintain, to make sure people are using it correctly. Um, my major one that I, I make sure the PEOs are watching is the disabled parking spaces. Um, our officers really like to give those tickets to people that don't need to be in those locations. So we really enforce that, hey, if you're not seeing that hang tag, if you're not seeing that license plate, Make sure we're taking care of that so the people that do need those spots are, are involved and can get in there. All of these measures are done through performance. Um, and our big thing is we want frequency of service. Our buses have to run so people get to work on time or get to where they need to go. Reliability of service, newer buses, less breakdown, less problems. 
Um, newer facilities, less issues with, with on the parking side. Um, and efficiency of service. And that's done, efficiency is done through the team that we have. And not only through the team we have, but I can't say enough for me being here five months and seeing the partnerships that we already have throughout the city of Dubuque. Um, I can't say enough to Public Works for not only maintaining our buses, but keeping the, ro the roads clean. Um, Marie Ware and Leisure Services do such a job, nice job of keeping this community looking so nice. Um, Steve Sampson Brown and the engineering team, um, a lot of our CIPs in here were put together with him and his knowledge on the engineering side. Um, and also, uh, Chief Jansen was here the other night and talked about de-escalation training. We actually had the police department come in, did a round, two rounds of de-escalation training for our team. I had multiple drivers come up and say how helpful that was. Um, this was a great presentation. They didn't talk at us, they talked with us. Um, and we definitely saw a lot of involvement between the drivers and their presenter for that. Um, I, I'm, I know they're on the phone, uh, the finance team, Jenny and, and Jason and Robin, um, but also my team, Russ Steckline, Jody Johnson, and Jake Ironside. Um, and with that, I am here to take any questions. All right, thank you very much, Ryan. We'll open for public comment first, please. At this time, anyone participating in the meeting in person who would like to discuss this public hearing may approach the podium when the mayor asks if there is any in-person input for this public hearing. For all remote attendees, please enter your name and address in the chat function and state your question or state your name and address over the phone when the mayor asks if there is any virtual input for this public hearing. Please begin your input by stating your name and address. All right, thank you, Adrian. Do we have any public comment? Yes, sir, please come up. Good evening, Mayor and City Council. Uh, Greg Orwall, uh, 2635 West 32nd, and I am the Executive Director of Do Ride. Uh, I'm just going to take a few minutes and thank you for the continuing support, the extra support we got last year, and again this year certainly is helping us get over the bump that we're all experiencing with COVID, um, and that that's going, uh, you know, certainly being noticed. Um, the last few years, uh, city support has been about 15% of our operating budget, and that's really kind of been our target, 15 to 20%. This extra 5,000 will get city support to about 18%, uh, and that's, that's gonna be a big help. Uh, it's a, one of the Chinese dialects, uh, the word crisis uh, can be substituted for opportunity. And that is in fact what uh, we experienced here at Do Ride. <clears throat> um, our last normal month, was February of 2020, and we provided 1,037 rides that month. Um, March of 2020, of course, when COVID descended, and uh, we immediately limited our rides to nothing but medical appointments. And the first full month of COVID in April of 2020, uh, we went from 1,037 rides in February to 57 in April. Uh, and that represents the ridership fee, which is only $5 a ride. It's subsidized, certainly, but it still represents 40% of our operating budget. So we had to cut, we did layoffs, we got some PPP help from this federal government, which all combined with our operating reserve allowed us to get through. Um, while we were not doing those rides, uh, our membership, that being our rider 65 plus, our essentially pretty vulnerable anyways, but particularly the older folks that don't have transportation that live alone. But during COVID, it got even worse. Not only were we shut out physically uh, from the community in a lot of ways, but the loneliness and, and to, a, to some extent, even the desperation of being there by yourself, not knowing what's gonna happen, uh, was a huge mental health kind of a situation that we were able to help uh, uh, address. We ended up with seven new programs uh, that came out of COVID and we're gonna continue with six of them. We started a birthday card club. That doesn't seem like a big thing unless you're turning 93 years old <laughs> or 100 or whatever. And we have 29 volunteers that provide personal birthday cards to every member month to month. And since we started that, uh, we've sent out over 11,000 birthday cards to our members. The note that we got back from the person that just turned 100 said it was the best birthday part present she'd had since she was 12. Uh, and that goes a long ways, and that's a surprise. They, they don't expect that. All of a sudden your mailbox is full of cards for people. Uh, we also sent out when COVID first started, uh, just thinking of you cards, <coughs> excuse me, 
just handwritten to each individual member from our volunteers saying, here's my name, here's my phone number. If you need anything, please call. Uh, and that then turned into weekly welfare calls. And each of our, of, of our members got a personal call from a volunteer. We had over 50 of our, uh, at the time, 179 volunteers doing those calls. And for that year that we did that, that was something a little over 10,000 uh, personal phone calls that went out to our members. Uh, we started a shopping service that was no touch, where a member would call and say, I need help with getting groceries or whatever the case may be. A volunteer then would call them, get their shopping list, go out and get it for them, deliver it to their door, uh, call in advance and say, hey, it was $51, check in the mailbox and the groceries inside the front door. We're still continuing that. So far, we've done 235 shopping trips for people. Uh, we started then partnering with the Convivium, their uh, weekly casseroles uh, for food insecure people. They had an explosion of, of, of demand for that, and they did not have a, a, a delivery service that would go door to door. We took most of that over, and we're still doing that. We've done about 3,500 of those deliveries so far. We worked with Salvation, uh, uh, Salvation Army Food Pantry. They had not in the past done very much at all in the way of home delivery, but a lot of folks lost access to transportation. We took that part of it over for them. And then finally, we partnered with the City of Dubuque and the Health Department, provided free rides for anybody that wanted to get to a COVID vaccination and, and lack transportation. So all of those things we started and all but the Salvation Army because they filled up that need on their own, we're gonna continue to do. Uh, in terms of rides, uh, we went to 2,625 rides the first full year of COVID. We're now this year projecting, this fiscal year, that we're going to get back to 6,500, which is a little over halfway to the average three-year number of rides prior to COVID. So we're coming back slowly but surely. Um, since we started, through the end of February, we provided 120,991 rides and our volunteer drivers with zero reimbursement for gas as of November had ridden over or driven over 1 million miles. So we will continue to do all we can to support our, our members and our community as opportunities come forward that we're in a position to help with, we will continue to do so. So thank you so very much. It's also, I'd like to tell you, it's a real pleasure working with Ryan. He's a very insightful man. We both have a love of Disney as a, in common, so half of our first meeting was about you know the new rides, but we did get work done as well. So thank you so very much. Thank you, Greg, for being here to share that with us. Any other public comment? Virtually? No virtual comments. All right. And no emails received. All right, back to the table for discussion then. Yeah, Mr. Sprank, yeah. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, Ryan, welcome, welcome on board. Um, and sh you're, you're taking on a challenge that I'm sure uh, Russ has been helping you through quite a bit, so. And thank you to Russ too, because he took on, just it got dropped on his plate lap. So, a um, couple questions. Mm -hmm. Are we thinking we're gonna ever bring back the Night Rider program? That is a very good question, and that is something that we are researching right now. Um, we are researching that, and we also, we also have a grant um, that we're waiting on hearing notice on to possibly implement a new route from the intermodal out to Chavanel Road. Um, but the Night Rider is something that we do wanna look at. Um, from past records, I heard that the Night Rider in a given weekend can do up to a thousand rides. Um, definitely a big help. And with talking to some of the drivers, um, say ha they have some of the best stories from the Night Rider. So um, that is something that's definitely on the plate. Uh, the GDDC also has brought that up. So we're definitely looking at that coming up. Um, the new infrastructure bill, right now they're just focusing on facilities and on equipment. We're looking future state to see what else they'll have there. And then could you go back to slide 18, which shows your routes? With, with your new system that you've implemented, the new uh, pay system, where you, is it a card that you now have? Yes, we have the new GenFair system. So it is a card-based system, or you can pay by cash. Um, but that system is based on a card. Students ride for free, as long as you're a student. Um, most ridership is $1.50, and then I believe 75 cents if you're a senior. 
Are we able to track the people that are taking the express? So this would be downtown taking the other routes around. Are we able to track that yet or not really? Like We can track, I can track the people on the express going out there, but when they get out there, they get a transfer ticket yeah. and I'm not able to track that at the current time. Um, that is something that we're currently actually digging into right now with the eco lane and our, our system that we have. What I get, what I'm getting at is, I'd really like to know, like, how many people are using the bus for not just getting to work, but are they getting, you know, are they using it for, as their main source of transportation? Like, how often are people really getting off at the grocery store? Like, are we able to target that yet with the new system? Or like- with the new system, I can't target. With the current system that we have, I cannot target if they're getting off at Farm and Fleet or High V. It just shows the ridership and the and the type of pass they were using. Okay. All right, thank you. Mr. Mayor, <laughs> there's a race there. Mr. Resnick, thank you very much. First of all, I've been uh, very privileged to work with uh, in the same building with Mr. Orwall the last three and a half years. And I have to say it's been a pleasure. He's a, despite the gruff exterior, obviously a heart of gold. So thank you. He does great work. Every time I interrupt him, I always interrupt him. I, I have something I have to... Well, I talked to him about uh, as far as nonprofits. He he's always busy, and uh, his uh, folks are on the line helping others. Great conversations, and it, it's uh, such a valuable service to our community. So thank you to you, your your staff, and your volunteers, and thank you very much for your presentation. Um, unfortunately, I'm not familiar with your previous uh, professional experiences. So, do you have experience with smart parking? in other areas or? or? I, I do not have a background in the parking world. Um, what we're doing, and this is why we're reaching out to a consultant to come in to show the city of Dubuque, other cities that work this in a similar way. Um, one thing that we are doing is, while we're moving on with the consultant interviews, we are internally reaching out to these parking systems to see what is out there. Um, I've reached out to six different systems currently already to figure out what can the city of Dubuque use and also I'm looking at where are these parking systems at? I don't want a parking system that's from Tampa, Florida. We, we don't have the same weather, we don't have the, the climate like they do. Um, I want something that's used in the Midwest that can handle the, the harsh winters, the hot summers. Um, so we're figuring out, and I've talked to different systems where everything would be literally, um, it'd be wireless, we wouldn't have the meters, it'd all be done by cameras, um, license plate readers. Uh, and then I've also talked to systems where they do have parking meters on their parking lots. So I've talked to all different realms. Um, the big thing is when the consultants are coming back with the, with the recommendations for the city, as the city, I want to be able to question their recommendations to make sure that they're not just um, giving us their, their fast one-liner, I'll call it, and that they're actually doing what we're, we're paying them to do. Well, I did like your answer about uh, electric buses, that you're not you're not satisfied yet, and you're not falling for a sales pitch, and I'm sure a lot of people would like you to buy their certain kind of electric buses, but they have to you know, match our expectations and be right for the city of Dubuque, and that's what I was hoping that we could do with smart parking. A lot of people are gonna be saying this is great and uh, this would be perfect for your city, but I'm glad you're, you're reaching out and uh, really learning about these things, and uh, I don't know if you're from, if you're from Missouri, but the, I like the show me attitude that you have as far as smart parking, because uh, we really want this to go well. And, uh, you know, if something new happens around here. You know, there's initial skepticism, and until we say that, it's, oh, this is working great. This is just what we need, uh, um, and it's happened many times here in Dubuque with roundabouts and other type of things that citizens of Dubuque now really like. Uh, so smart parking is big change. I'm glad you're there, and I'm sure you're going to give it a good going over once you get all the, the data. So thank you very much. Thank, thank you, you very Mr. much, Mr. Resnick. Thank you. Uh, Ms. <laughs> I saw Ms. Roussel raised her hand, so <laughs> yeah. I'm going with that. Oh, thank you. I think what I like about your um, transportation presentation is the flexibility that you offer for our residents and that you work to meet the needs of so many people, and um, especially with the minibus. Um, I reached out to my mom, and I'm sure she represents a lot of seniors who uh, want to maintain their, their um, independence, but they no longer drive. And so but mom said, 
I don't know what I'd do without it. And I think that probably says the same for all the people in your ridership. I don't know what they would do without it. So thank you for all that you do. I'm, I'm very happy you touched on that. Um, Jody Johnson and I had a call today with our Ecolane. It's our current minibus system that we use. Um, and there are some application on there that will actually make it easier for the end customer. Um, we haven't used them yet. We haven't dove into and figured out how to use them. But the goal is, is we'll be able to have an online app that the passengers will be able to use to set their trips up and also cancel if needed. I'll have to show her how to do that. <laughs> well, we're, we're a little ways away from that. Today we were downloading it, tinkering with it, and we're saying we need a lot more training on it. Um, we'll do have to do a, a, a beta test with it to make sure that it works how we want it to work prior to rolling it out. Thank you. All right, Ms. Farmer, thanks Mr. for Mr. Mayor, picture. thank you. And Ryan, welcome, and thank you for your presentation. Um, I do have a budget question mm -hmm. uh, that relates to the new downtown parking ramp and the 2.348 882 uh, line item uh, that's listed there. And I know that um, Mike had mentioned that he was in conversation with both Heartland and uh, DB&T and that they were delaying uh, the um, start of the ramp project. And based on some, uh, the fact that there's a lot of businesses today that are not necessarily gonna go back to full time and there's still the uh, work at home, if you will, the new normal of uh, how business is going to operate downtown to be determined and also with some changes in ownership structure in some of these businesses. So I was just wondering, um, that line item is pretty significant uh, for fiscal year 23. Just was wondering what we do with those funds uh, when they are not being used. Mike, maybe you could give me some, some insight into that. Yeah, thank you for that question. Um, so there's a lot of preparation that goes into building a parking ramp. And... Um, there's also other elements of our agreements with these parties that we're okay. obligated to fulfill. So for instance, by May of this year, we have to improve the lighting and the pedestrian corridors downtown that are getting that people to their existing parking ramps. And in addition, uh, we're obligated to install some more of those uh, 911 blue light call boxes. So we'll be doing that and that expense will be several hundred thousand dollars. And then we've got to begin the planning for the new parking ramp. And while we're not going to complete all the design work in FY23, we certainly will start it. And we also have some additional uh, acquisition obligations as far as easements and, and some other space that we're working on right now. So it's hard to put an exact number on what will be spent in 23, but mm -hmm. we definitely need a significant amount of money available to us. Okay, so basically that is um, up, uh, upgrading uh, based on some commitments and then basically just the um, upfront cost of what we need in order to get the ramp potentially built. Is that what I'm understanding? Yes. Okay. All right. You're off the hook, Ryan. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Any others? All right. Well, um, Thank you very much for the presentation. I, I just have one question, and I, I don't think I heard the answer to it. The timeline for the smart parking study, just can you remind me what that is again, uh, and, and where we're going next with the smart parking? Smart parking study is, we're in the consultant interview stage right now. Yep. We hope we actually have input from our core group that is, actually, it was due today. Um, it's back to the consultants. We should have information back from them, hopefully next week. Then we're going to sit down with the core group, figure out which way we want to go with it, which consultant best fits us. We're going to reach out to the stakeholders that we engaged in it. Um, and then as we sit down with the consultants, we want to build out a plan on, on how long this should take. Um, the goal, I believe the goal is by the end of this year to have something identified what we want to look at. Mm -hmm. But again, that's going to be us sitting down, figuring out how we get the consultant into the community to make sure that we get all the aspects and all the ass of the community. Um, so. The initial goal is within, I believe, the next month to have the consultant selected. And then from there, we need to sit down and set a timeline to figure out phase one, phase two, and the end approach to it. Got so it. as far as a final date, I do not have a hard date saying this will be done complete mm -hmm. by end of FY23. Um, I want to let that open to see what we can do and what can, we can expand on with the ask of the community. 
Okay. No, well, thank you for that. I appreciate it. And um, I think one of the things I enjoyed the most about what you discussed tonight is just the, the connection that you are making with community members, you know, with your ridership, with the people who need the transportation services that you provide. I, I appreciate that you're using social media to get in touch with people and be able to stay connected. I'm, I'm on your website now and seeing that there's a lot of ways that you do that here too. And I think that that's incredibly important because, um, you know, as a lot of a lot of us mentioned up here, it's, this is the only transportation for a lot of our residents. And it's something that is um, a major service that we provide. So thank you for all that you do and and everybody on the team who does it. Um, it's, a, it's a big team and you do a lot of work. And a great team. Yeah, yeah, thank you very much. So we appreciate you being here. Thank you, thank you very much for your time. All right, well it sure filled up in here. What's going on? Is there, is there another presentation? We have our final budget presentation coming with the engineering department, so I'll let you get set up, and we will uh, be back in a couple minutes. Very much, Mike. You ready? I think we are. So as I mentioned, we are in our final budget presentation here. We have the engineering department. We have 15 improvement packages requested, 12 of which I believe I counted right are recommended. So Gus, welcome. We can get started. Good evening, Mr. Mayor and members of the City Council. Gus Sohoya, City Engineer, and I present to you the Engineering Department budget. Uh, the mission statement uh, for the Engineering Department is it promotes the health, the safety, and the welfare of all through sound engineering principles, practices, and partnerships applied to the planning, design, maintenance, and the preservation of the city's infrastructure and property. I want to thank Tom Freund for all his years of service. Tom recently uh, retired in October of last year. He served the city for over 35 years. Thank you, Tom. Uh, we welcome traffic engineer Justine Hall and facilities manager Justine, Justin Hogan to the engineering department. Welcome. Also, right away, technician Rob McDonald and camera systems technician Dave Spiegelhalter. Uh, we have some vacant positions that are yet to fill. Uh, a part-time utility locator, which is pending improvement uh, request that you'll see a little bit later. We have an engineering technician position, Tommy's position, Tom Freund's position. Uh, we've uh, made a recommendation and there, it's being reviewed right now. And then we have a civil engineering two position uh, that was frozen for quite a while that we have not received any applicants for over a year now. Um, filling the civil engineering uh, position has been a problem, it's problematic. We posted it three times in the last year and uh, we really haven't received any um, viable candidates. So the vacancy continues to impact our timely review of private projects and CFP projects, but everybody's having a problem hiring um, people right now, so that's a problem for the engineering department. Uh, the organizational chart for the engineering department shows all 40.21 full-time equivalents here. The engineering department continually incorporates equity in our work through an equitable community choice through planning, partnerships, and people. As part of the engineering department equity plan, we are focused on youth mentoring activities and exposure to potential careers in the engineering and construction industry. Hosting Pollinator Week at the B Branch and getting kids involved from all parts of the community, participating in the MFC Teen Career Fair, and coordinating with Dubuque Community School Districts and participating in career days at Dubuque Senior High and Hempstead High Schools. And we also provide job shadowing opportunities for students interested in civil engineering and construction careers. Uh, we're continuing to look at other ways to get students involved from diverse uh, backgrounds interested in engineering public works and potentially working for the city someday. Um, additionally, this year we uh, started a volunteer effort called Dubuque Shovel Crew. This effort involved recruiting 16 volunteers, four of which were city staff, that assisted with removing snow from public sidewalks at 22 locations. Residents needed to financially qualify for the program and be unable to perform the work themselves. Staff had a registration website, uh, www.volunteerdebuke.com, as shown here, and for those people needing assistance. This voluntary assistance resulted in a potential savings of over $11,000 uh, less needed to uh, um, 
for the people to shovel their sidewalks. So thank you all the volunteers that volunteered and the four uh, city staff. Uh, this slide shows a variety of ADA ramps that the city of Dubuque installed recently. This past year, engineering staff have coordinated with Public Works Department to install over 150 ramps. This is a 100% increase over the previous year and is directly related to the 10 miles of street overlays Public Works performed last year. Engineering staff designed and bid four separate projects to facilitate the construction of these 150 ramps. This effort continues to show Dubuque's effort to provide accessibility for pedestrians through routes for the, all citizens of Dubuque. Um, last year, the B Branch Tunneling uh, Project began July 4th and was completed right at Halloween. This included six eight-foot diameter culverts, uh, about 200 foot long under the CP Railroad near Garfield. This took numerous years to accomplish, so I thank everybody involved, particularly Darren and Steve, to get this mammoth uh, project uh, completed on time. Uh, Chaplain Schmidt Memorial was completed and dedicated last year as a beautiful facility paying tribute to those who served in our armed services. Uh, these are great pictures here, I think. Um, Chevenel Road uh, will be completed this spring, along with Chevenel Trail uh, that started this week and it, it will also be completed this spring. The city has four subdivision projects representing 227 residential uh, lots under construction right now. So uh, engineering staffs are involved with the on-site inspection for the utilities and street improvements. Beside this work, our staffs also involved with uh, at least 15 commercial site developments right now. These projects involve extensive review and follow inspection by staff. Here's some photos of some of the projects involved. Uh, more specifically, the subdivision pro projects uh, require this inspection and management. We typically do all that stuff in-house. Uh, the 15 development projects require multiple department review and coordination and require a substantial amount of engineering time. Here's a list of some of the upcoming projects that are planned this construction year. Some of these will actually carry into the next fiscal year. These projects uh, are well over $150 million. Uh, just one that I want to point out that we'll be bidding as uh, soon as the B Branch uh, gate and pump replacement project. That's an $18 million project. Um, and some of these projects we will mention in detail as this presentation continues. Uh, one of the things I want to talk about, we required our engineering department locates utilities per Iowa code, and we have to do that within 48 hours after we're notified a, a, a utility locate is necessary. So this is a, a job that the engineering department takes over, and it's a 24-7, 365 days a year that we have people either on call or we have our full-time locator dur during the normal work week. So um, our department takes care of all this. The uh, call volume has gone up substantially in the last 10 years since we started this um, endeavor here. So uh, the coverage areas of the city has become larger due to the city land growth. As a result, we have improvement level requests to address this increase in workload. This slide uh, highlights the increase in one call volumes. We have more locates to locate, the utilities to locate, and a larger coverage area. Um, so for instance, in the last 10 years, we've installed 22 miles of sanitary sewer, which needs to be located, along with 13 miles of storm sewer. 18 and a half miles of water we <clears throat> main we've installed in the last 10 years. We've purchased uh, 13 and a half miles of private water systems. Uh, we've installed 50 miles of conduit, fiber conduit, uh, six miles of irrigation, and we've added 520 street lights in the last 10 years. So uh, trend lines uh, and call volumes continues to go up. Uh, the one blip that you see in the screen in 2021 is probably due to the COVID where uh, businesses um, delayed work. Our engineering department technicians and utility locator positions cover the one calls, like I said, 24-7, 365 days a year, which takes them from their other duties uh, in order to accomplish uh, the demand 
for locating all these utilities. The number one priority for the engineering department is to add a full-time locator position this year. Um, again, like I said, we have to do that within 48 hours. Otherwise, the city is responsible for any damages. Uh, here's some also some other improvement levels that we're requesting. Um, one of is a Trimble GPS rover that can be used for our locates and uh, surveying in the field. Um, these are some other, um, I won't read them out to you. We can talk about them separately if you want to, but here's some other improvement levels that uh, we've identified needs for. And this is the property tax support for the engineering department. And next, uh, Darren Murian, civil engineer, will present the sanitary sewer budget. Good evening, Mayor and City Council members. Uh, Civil Engineer Darren Beering. Um, the Engineering Department plays a role um, in the city's program to uh, comply with a consent decree agreement with the Iowa Department of Natural Resources and the US EPA. And the stated goal is to eliminate all sanitary sewer overflows. Uh, mainly, we're involved with identifying and eliminating the infiltration of groundwater or the inflow of stormwater or I&I &I, as it's referred to, into the sanitary sewer system. Uh, as part of the consent decree, our efforts concentrate on five specific sewer sheds that had excessive levels in I&I, and, I, and these uh, investigative efforts led to the creation of a corrective action plan uh, to eliminate the I&I, &I, and this corrective action plan was actually approved by the uh, IOD DNR and also the US EPA, um, and the, the corrective action plan in, in involves addressing both private and public issues. Of the projects identified in the corrective action plan this past year, we completed the Wood Street Sanitary Sewer uh, Project, uh, and then um, uh, the Heap Street Sanitary Sewer Improvements are now scheduled uh, to kind of be respectful of citizens' money to coincide with the street, street work that's going to be done in this coming fiscal year. The proposed FY23 budget includes funding to complete both the Auburn and Custer sanitary sewer work and also the Grove Terrace sanitary sewer construction work. And all of the public improvements specifically identified in the corrective action plan are to be completed uh, per the schedule outlined in the corrective action plan within the proposed five-year CIP budget. Beyond the consent decree, the engineering department also helps design, bid, and oversee construction of sanitary sewer improvements. Uh, one of the significant projects currently under development is the stabilization of the 42-inch force main sanitary sewer, uh, shown in red here, that runs along the Mississippi to the Water Research Recovery Center. There are several locations along the pipe length that are exposed, as shown on the right. Um, on the left, uh, is, is, is cross-section of the original design. Uh, the middle photo shows the pipe under construction in 1977. And then again, the photo on the right shows what the pipe looks like at today at several locations. So the project involves reburying the pipe and reestablishing the original design. Uh, we're fortunate to be working on this effort in partnership with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. And uh, I think in, in May sometime, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers will be sharing a design and construction agreement. Um, that will outline costs, but based on the, the prelim preliminary work done by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, the city's anticipated cost share of the $5.5 .5 million project will be approximately $1.9 million. The anticipated schedule is to hopefully have bidding later this year, late this fall, with construction in 2023. Another planned effort is the Sanitary Sewer Asset Master Plan. As outlined here, the study involves looking both at the condition and service levels of our existing system to ultimately arrive at a prioritized listing of improvements. Um, you know, when we look at the size of the Catfish Creek Sanitary Interceptor Sewer example, we as, we as a community, we need to decide what area we expect it to serve for the next 30 to 50 years. For example, the sewer, as shown here, the sewer could serve up to 27,000 acres of p potentially developed land, but 
two-thirds of that extends outside the city's existing corporate limits. So again, as a community, we kind of need to make some decisions as to what we, we expect that sewer system to be able to handle going forward. And this is the budget for that planned effort. Another example is the original sections of the Catfish Creek Interceptor sewer system were constructed around 1960. And the system has served the sewer well over the past 60 years. Um, it has served the city well. Um, you know, it's allowed for continued growth. In fact, in just the past 20 years, roughly 2,500 acres have been developed within the sewer shed, adding approximately one and a half million gallons per day of wastewater flow to the Water Research Recovery Center. Um, and, and the system is, is approaching its capacity limits. And so, um, you know, while a sanitary sewer asset, asset master plan will better inform the need, we anticipate the need to upgrade the system from the, from the water, research, water Research Recovery Center along South Fork, Catfish Creek, you know, the system that extends out to the landfill and the, and the Dubuque Industrial Center, Siple, and along the Middle Fork, Catfish Creek that extends out to the Dubuque Industrial Center along Chavanel. Uh, the total cost to upgrade the system would be in the neighborhood of like $67 million. Uh, the proposed five-year CIP budget reflects funding in FY26 and 27 that would allow for starting to uh, develop um, some of those sewer upgrades. You know, with the passing of the bipartisan infrastructure law, the state of Iowa will be able to provide grants and forgivable loans. And while it's unknown at this point how Iowa will allocate this funding, the improvements uh, for the Catfish Creek sewer system would be eligible for clean water SRF loans and possible uh, forgivable loans. And the Catfish Creek sewer system all drains to the Catfish Creek lift station. Last updated in 1995, it's at the end of its 25-year design life. That doesn't mean that it's failing or falling apart or in disrepair. It just means that it was designed 25 years ago to accommodate the flow we expected today. And so it's now time to consider, you know, how well did our projections, you know, how close do we hit the mark, but then also look, okay, for the next 25, 30 years, what does this system need to, um, you know, accommodate? And so in order to accommodate both short-term and long-term needs, we've been working on the engineering design of a new lift station on Old Mill Road that would take most of the demand off the existing Catfish Creek lift station. Uh, a new force main is also planned to deliver the wastewater from the lift station all the way to the Water Research Recovery Center. Uh, the facility is being designed to accommodate upgrades uh, in the future, you know, driven by potential development. So it's designed so we can expand it easily in the future when the, when the need arises. Currently we're working on the engineering design and the proposed FY23 budget will allow for beginning construction in FY23 and of the force main and lift station system and com with completion in FY26. Um, the project to be constructed using an FR I'm sorry, an SRF loan administered by the Iowa DNR. Again, it's unknown how the Iowa will allocate grants and forgivable loans associated with the bipartisan infrastructure law, but the Old Mill Road lift station and force main project is on the state uh, intended use plan which is it will be a prerequisite to be eligible for possible forgivable loans. So receipt of a forgivable loan could accelerate the project schedule and obviously offset some of the costs to the Dubuque citizens. Um, here are all the CIP projects that are proposed in the FY23 budget. I've already talked a little bit about the ones in, in yellow. Um, wanted to provide a little more detail on, on three other noteworthy projects. Uh, one of the projects involves tunneling a new sanitary sewer under the railroad tracks near the Bee Branch Creek. It'll allow us to eliminate a, a siphon that was installed as part of the upper Bee Branch Creek. Siphons are, are maintenance headaches. They're, they, they're prone to building sediment and decreasing capacity. So uh, it'll be nice to get rid of that, that siphon, sy siphon system. This will be funded using ARPA funding and it's on schedule to be bid this spring with construction to follow this summer. The proposed budget also includes funding to address needs within the Granger Creek Sanitary Sewer System. And this, this system is actually upstream of the Catfish Creek lift, lift Station. But again, this lift station was originally constructed in 1999, mainly to serve the Dubuque Technology Park. So again, it's nearing the end of its design life. 
And so we're looking at our, our current needs and there is development taking place in that part of our community. So the proposed improvements will actually provide six times the capacity of the existing facility to accommodate the development within the sewer shed. Uh, one of those is the planned connection to serve the Twin Ridge subdivision. It, the project involves extending the sewer from the Dubuque Technology Park under, under the highway and, and serve some of the homes within the, within the subdivision and allow for the abandonment of the uh, lagoons that are currently uh, treating the wastewater from those homes. Another Granger Creek sewer shed project is the extension of sewer to serve the Tamarack Business Park. Um, it's in accordance with the agreement we have with them to extend sewer and serve this area within a couple of years. And then um, from there, the proposed FY20 budget also includes funding to install a sewer system uh, that would serve the Dubuque Industrial Center crossroads located just adjacent. Um, moving on to the stormwater management budget. You know, in Iowa, every property owner is responsible for managing stormwater, you know, on their property, and, and the city is no different. Um, but the city does have additional responsibilities. As a requirement of the Federal Clean Water Act, the city must comply with the terms of a permit issued by the state of Iowa in order to discharge stormwater into waters in the United States, or like the Mississippi River or the Catfish Creek. And so this permit requires the city to inspect construction sites that disturb at least an acre of ground or more. In this past year, we inspected over, over 200 sites. Well, we performed over 200 inspections. Many of those were probably return inspections based on deficiencies that were found. For sites that deserve over an acre, we also are required to review, review development plans to ensure that they will not cause downstream erosion or, or uh, pollutant, pollu pollution issues. Again, uh, over 16 plans so far that in FY22. And finally, we're also required to inspect private sites once every five years to verify that they were actually constructed and that they're being maintained to function as designed and approved. This past year, we performed 187 inspections. And just as an example, uh, on the left, there's a detention basin that shows standing water and erosive embankments. And then on the right, the corrected or uh, with the, the detention basin after the performed uh, appropriate repairs were made. Uh, we also work on minor stormwater management issues, mainly dealing you know, with providing adequate dra drainage for the public right away and say on, on city owned property. Uh, our drain tile program is, is, is an example. You know, it's illegal for someone to direct sump pump discharge into the sanitary sewer system. You know, this would be a form of I and I that I talked about that um, would potentially lead to a sanitary sewer overflow. So what people are left to do is to discharge it to the street which is part of the public drainage system, so that is allowed. It's just that in some instances, um, that could lead to icing in the streets if those sump pumps are running through the winter. Uh, and then in some of those limited circumstances, it can potentially create hazardous conditions like depicted here, where uh, ice might sheet across the street right at an intersection, you know, which causes unsafe conditions for uh, vehicular traffic. And so the proposed five-year CIP uh, we've been working on, on a list of, of projects um, the past couple of years, but proposed FY, the proposed five-year CIP will allow us to address these known issues within five years. Uh, we also work on smaller projects, you know, that might impact a neighborhood. Uh, for instance, the Wilbright Lane Detention Basin was to address a situation where stormwater actually flows out of a city storm sewer onto city property. Uh, so this time last year, we were discussing improvements and designing improvements to pond the water in an underutilized portion of Flora Park shown here in blue. Um, but as we study the system, you know, we look downstream and, and we actually identified drainage issues on Marmora Avenue and Poland Avenue and actually had conversations with citizens to verify that there are actually there are issues there that uh, need addressing. And so uh, we looked at to examine maximizing the benefit of the Wilbright Lane Detention Basin uh, to, like, to maximize its benefits. Like as shown here, the project now involves shifting uh, a portion of Flora Park Drive to the west to allow for a larger footprint and increased storage for the proposed detention basin. Um, the city council actually authorized initiation of the public bidding process on this project earlier this week. Uh, the city also undertakes major stormwater management uh, projects that impact hundreds of properties. And the prime example of that is the 
uh, Bee Branch Watershed Flood Mitigation Project, uh, a multi-phase you know, project to um, assist and, and prevent flooding in, in neighborhoods and impacting 1,300 uh, families and businesses. Uh, for the past 20 years, we've been working to complete the various phases of the project, and, and we still have more work to do. Uh, one of the phases we've been working on recently is the 17th Street Storm Sewer Improvements Project. Uh, we've completed the project construction, uh, shown in, in yellow and green here, from Elm Street to Heave Street, and we're in the process of finishing up the design for the areas in the dash blue. Uh, for example, on the right side of the screen, uh, as you get close to the lower B branch, we're working with the, with the, the railroad there to uh, work through the design phase, so they're on board, so that we're ready to have these projects go when funding allows. We're also making progress on the flood maintenance facility. We'll be completing the environmental cleanup this spring and summer with help from a $600,000 EPA uh, grant. Uh, the site will ultimately provide for a maintenance facility, public restrooms, public parking, um, green space, and a scenic overlook. And as Gus pointed out, we've also been making progress on the Bee Ranch Creek Railroads Culvert Project. Um, just a reminder, these improvements are being constructed between the lower B branch and the upper B branch through the Canadian Pacific Railroad, uh, Railroad Yard on Garfield Avenue. Um, this is a rendering of the, of the planned improvements showing the buried pipes under the railroad tracks that, as Gus mentioned, were installed and completed by Halloween of 2020. The, you know, the main goal of this project is to improve flood protection. The engineering standard has been to design drainage systems to handle the 100-year storm, you know, a storm that has a 1% chance of occurring in any given year. So why are we building a system to handle a 500-year storm? There, there will not be a test after the end of this, so you, you can <laughs> relax. But, you know, when we started designing the Bee Branch Creek project in 2008, the 100-year storm was considered 6.36 inches of rain in 24 hours. By the time we moved into construction in the Upper Bee Branch, uh, based on the work that the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration had done updating those figures, 6.36 uh, six inches of rain is now, in 24 hours is now only considered a 50-year storm. And, you know, what will the future bring? You know, looking at the last 50 years of rain data, the trend indicates that the rainfall could increase by 20 percent over the next 50 years. And if uh, that, if that, that would mean that what is considered today as the 100-year storm, the 7.65 inches in 24 hours, would only be a 50-year storm 50 years from now. And, you know, some have predicted increases by as much as 30 percent. Again, we can't predict with any certainty what will happen, but to be resilient, we should ask, what if? And so if it does increase by 30 percent, then today's 500-year storm could become tomorrow's 100-year storm. So to ensure that the Bee Branch Creek improvements provide flood mitigation benefits for the next 50 to 100 years, it's been designed and constructed to handle the storms of the future, whatever they might be. In addition to the increased flood resiliency benefits, the project also provides, uh, allows for the dual use of the system, which includes a hike bike trail under the railroad tracks. And thanks to funding assistance uh, through a Land and Water Conservation Fund grant, sometime this May, citizens will be able to enjoy an off-road trail from the Mississippi along the Bee Branch under the railroad tracks pictured here, uh, up through the Dubuque's North End and the Cooler Valley all the way 30 miles to the west of Dyersville. So that'll be a, an amazing uh, addition to our trail system. The top image here shows a computer rendering of the south end of the Bee Branch Railroad Coverage Project. Just a little bit to the left of where the last image was shown. And then the bottom photo was actually taken late last year. The project cost is about $32.3 million. And as shown here, the city was able to secure state and federal <coughs> funding to cover almost 50% of that total project cost. And as many of you know, on a cold and rainy day last October, we celebrated the project reaching the milestone of providing the design flood protection. And the contractor, as I mentioned, is working to complete the project and have everything done early May. And, uh, you know, the city is going to look to celebrate the Bee Branch, hosting several events on the Bee Branch as part of Pollinator Week this coming June. 
and you know, follow social media as we're always working on and developing other events along the B Branch to uh, allow citizens to enjoy this uh, beautiful amenity to our community. Um, and with the completion of the project this spring, hopefully there'll be a lot more opportunities for fishing in the, in the creek this year. We've also been completing the design of the flood mitigation gate and pump replacement project improvements. The existing facility functions as part of the John C. Culver levee system, and it's shown here on Cooper Boulevard. It's located between 12th and 16th Street. Um, this is a close-up of the existing facility that was constructed as part of the flood wall levee system around 1970. The two 90,000 gallon per minute pumps are actually more than 50 years old as they predate the flood wall improvements themselves. The proposed improvements will double the pumping capacity and along with the other improvements listed here, the project is designed to handle the 500 year flood from the Bee Branch Creek and increase the re overall resiliency of the system. Uh, the top image here shows the facility today and then again on the bottom is a computer rendering of the proposed system uh, looking from the basin or ponding side uh, of the um, uh, Kerber Boulevard. So one of the changes is to move the facility from the say the river side to the basin side. There's a close up of the view um, from the basin. And then another view from Kerper Boulevard looking towards the basin. The estimated project cost is 18.9 million and uh, as shown here two thirds of that funding is coming from state and federal partners. This project is also on the SRF intended use plan, again, a prerequisite for any forgivable loans the state might award, so we're in position to potentially get uh, some of that assistance here as well on this project. The total cost of the B Branch Watershed Flood Mitigation Project is estimated to be about $250 million. Of that, the city has secured over $165 million in local, state, and federal funding assistance. Um, here are all the projects that have, are at least partially funded in FY23. I already spoke about these couple projects. One other one I wanted to talk just briefly about was the Moss Lake Culvert Restoration Project. Uh, Moss Park also serves as a ponding area in conjunction with the flood wall and levee system. It's located in the <coughs> southern half or southern portion of the city near the river. Um, a few years ago, an issue arose with the culvert that runs from the lake the, or the uh, yeah, Moss Lake under the river tracks uh, through the levee to the river. So we've been working with the Army Corps of Engineers on designing and uh, put uh, ways to plan to rehab that culvert. Uh, there's, a, there's also a pending insurance claim uh, associated with the culvert failure that the city could recoup a portion of those project costs. Uh, in order to fund the proposed FY23 budget, the stormwater utility rate is proposed to increase to $9 for the average homeowner in FY23. Um, this is a year later than was adopted with the FY15 budget and actually five years later than was adopted with the FY13 budget. Proposed rate will result in a 15 cent increase or a $1.80 for the entire year for the average homeowner. And here's how Dubuque's proposed rate compares to the stormwater utility fees for other larger communities. Um, we are still uh, second uh, highest in the state, um, but as shown here, our proposed rate increase is less than other IO communities who are also raising the rates and uh, proposing to raise rates in FY23. The proposed budget uh, continues to offset the cost of the stormwater utility fee for property tax exempt customers, also low to moderate income customers and residential farms. <clears throat> and with that, I'll, I'll turn the presentation over to Mr. Deans to talk about the street project. Good evening, uh, this is, I'm, my, I'm John Deans, uh, civil engineer. Uh, I have uh, assistant city engineer, uh, Bob Shizzle. He'll be helping me on this uh, part of the presentation. And uh, congratulations, you made it to the halfway point. <laughs> okay, um, so with one of the prior uh, 
uh, highlights or some of the year uh, highlights we've had has been the completion of the paving in the Chavano Road. The project was challenging. Uh, we had uh, in the middle of the project we had a deal uh, with the water main. We had a water main issue on that stretch. I'm sure you're aware. Um, working with heavily with water department and uh, other departments, uh, we were able to construct that road, uh, get it paved, work with all the area businesses, still provide access for all those businesses, and um, and uh, we still have some work to, to to complete. We have a sidewalk section that we need to put in on the south side and restoration work to do this spring. Uh, and then we were uh, working through the DOT on the design of the phase two of the trail. And as Gus said, that uh, project has started uh, this week. Uh, we're uh, also working, have been working on the design of Stoneman Road up by Kennedy Mall. And uh, that's a project that's been on, you know, working in conjunction with the development of the Green State Credit Union site. It used to be Richardson Motors. Um, we are going to be putting in a, a right turn lane off of JFK as well as a new center or a new uh, left turn lanes on Stoneman to make it a safer intersection to get people in and out um, going to the mall or from the mall and from those other businesses up in that corridor. And uh, uh, we've also been involved with, as you're probably well aware, the JFK sidewalk project, um, which is a, a federal aid uh, project and uh, working on the uh, redesign of the B Branch Trail Phase 1. Here's kind of a list of some of our future projects. I mentioned uh, a couple of them already. Um, working with the uh, Water Department on the Altalger Street Eagle Water Main project. Up, uh, that's up by uh, Jefferson Middle School. Uh, we've got the Consent Decree project with Auburn uh, and Custer. Uh, we've got some pavement rehabilitation work, and then uh, Bob will talk a little bit more about the east-west corridor work here in, in the future slide. And then we've got, we're also working on some industrial park projects in coordination with uh, both uh, um, economic development as well as with water, and uh, um, putting the plans together for those. And then we've got um, some Mali projects that we're working on that are actually um, money that's coming, uh, clean water money, SRF clean water money that is uh, from the uh, railroad coverage project. We're able to direct and, and do some alleys. And then we're obviously working on some ramp projects and some tree stump uh, and sidewalk repair projects. Here's a, a list of the um, capital improvement projects that are street related. Uh, and. Uh, We'll go into detail on maybe one or two of these coming up. This is the uh, South Hecock Road extension project. This is a part of the industrial center expansion and uh, off of Chavanel Road over by D Duluth Trading. And we'll be uh, working on an extension, uh, working with economic development uh, to getting that designed. And uh, this would provide an extension up to the, to accommodate phase one. So that the Phase one pad there is the one that says phase one, it's, it's in red. We have got the Dubuque Industrial Center Crossroads project. We're working with you know, planning, working with economic development and water. Um, this is near the Southwest Arterial that we would stop and be able to accommodate phase one. And then the future phases would be accommodated in the five-year program. A little more detail on the Stoneman Road project. Uh, this is a project that is a multi-million dollar investment uh, um, development in this corridor. There's going to be new uh, pavement, curb and gutter, intake, sidewalk. There's some water main improvements, uh, street lights. Um, uh, so that's, and then we'll be putting a cul-de-sac at the end of this to really be able to accommodate the public works um, when they do snow removal and maintenance. Uh, rather than turning around in a private parking lot, uh, this you know we'll have them turning in our platted uh, in in our in our uh, cul-de-sac, and we've been in full coordination with all the abutting property owners um, for the last several months on this project. So um, that project is now all for bid this week. Heap Street is a project uh, that we're uh, uh, proposing to work on. Uh, this is a 
uh, consent decree project as well. There, there's sanitary sewer that we're going to extend up to the top of the hill. There's actually a house up the end that is still on septic. Um, the water main is uh, substandard um, and needs to be brought up to current size. And uh, there's lead services all the way up this street. So we'll be replacing the lead services, uh, replacing pavement. Um, yes, there's brick underneath it. And so we'll be salvaging and re, uh, re, you know, reclaiming uh, brick off the street as well. Sidewalk and trail projects. Uh, you can see if there's a, there's a um, plan set there on the uh, JFK project, which we've sent preliminary plans into the DOT. We're working through that process. Um, and through the federal aid process with DOT, it takes them a bit of time. And uh, we're anticipating uh, bidding that project um, in September. And that's following the federal aid process for the federal aid uh, letting schedule. And then we'll be again rebidding that, uh, um, that trail, uh, B Branch Trail Phase 1 around the uh, Alliance Solar Field uh, to try to get that closer to budget or to, our, uh, to what we have for available funding. And then we have our uh, listing here, some of our budget items here uh, related to uh, sidewalks and trails. I just want to point out to the city, uh, to the public as well, that with their investment that we do on trails and then sidewalks and on the ramps, um, you know, we are most definitely invested in, uh, in providing alternative transportation op options for those people, um, especially those that have, uh, have disabilities. Just a, click, a quick little uh, screenshot. Uh, we have a, we actually have a um, sidewalk uh, app that we use. Uh, one that's actually developed in house through G ArcGIS, working with Nikki, right, Becker and and uh, or Nick uh, Rosemeyer, sorry. Um, and we've developed these in in uh, these apps to work off an iPad and be able to document our ramp replacements as well as um, the stumps and working with uh, leisure services on tracking that. We replaced 204 stumps last year, uh, replaced them, or really replaced them, we removed them <laughs> and put in new sidewalk. But we are uh, on pace for this summer, uh, around 100 or so um, of stumps that we'll be removing and re redoing the sidewalks. And then you know, we have, again, probably another 150 ramps uh, of ADA ramps that we'll be doing. And then the performance measures, uh, just, just again, it just kind of shows in past years when we were doing five miles of um, over, overlays working with public works, we did probably 75 to 95 uh, ramps uh, a year and uh, 150. So when you do 10 miles, you know, about double that number. So we have 150 ramps that uh, we did, um, and that was a very busy year. And uh, we're probably doing the same thing this summer. So um, that's the plan. And I'll go ahead and turn this over to Bob then. Good evening, Mayor and City Council, Bob Schizel, Assistant City Engineer. Uh, the uh, street maintenance was listed as a city council policy agenda high priority and this pavement rehabilitation and preservation capital improvement program would support that goal. This program would provide funding to complete pavement rehabilitation on concrete streets that are in a deteriorated condition. The identified streets were originally constructed in the early 1990s and are exhibiting significant slab and joint deterioration. Public Works staff has performed street maintenance patching. However, uh, the pavements require major rehabilitation to extend the service life and reduce annual maintenance. North Grand View from Loris to Auburn was recommended for rehabilitation due to its major collector roadway classification and the high number of vehicles that travel North Grand View on a daily basis. The other locations recommended for major uh, street rehabilitation are several residential streets in the Embassy West 
and Sunny Slope subdivision, along with another segment of North Grand View from Boyer to 32nd Street. On an annual basis, staff will evaluate other streets that need pavement rehabilitation and we will continue to recommend funding in subsequent budget years. Effective January 29th of 2021, the transfer of jurisdiction of the Northwest Arterial was completed from the state of Iowa to the city as part of the Southwest Arterial project. As part of the roadway transfer, the Iowa DOT issued a state of good repair payment to the city in the amount of $5.672 million to complete pavement rehabilitation and reconstruction of the Northwest Arterial. The city will also include $3 million in DMATS uh, uh, swap funding. Additionally, prior to the roadway transfer, in 2019, Dubuque County was awarded a federal build grant to make capacity and safety improvements to John Deere Road. The Northwest Arterial State of Good Repair Project was a component that was added to the build grant because uh, the Northwest Arterial is a critical freight corridor that connects to South John Deere Road. The Northwest Arterial Project component will also provide the local match funding to the build grant. The Northwest Arterial State of Good Repair Project is a major initiative for the engineering department and Nate Steffen has worked hard to develop, design, and prepare construction documents for bidding. Uh, Construction of the John Deere Road improvements and the Northwest Arterial State of Good Repairs will be bid through the Iowa DOT and Ames on April 19th. Due to the magnitude, uh, of the magnitude and scope of the work on the Northwest Arterial, the project will not be able to be fully completed this coming construction season. The contract specifies a, a, a completion date of August 18th of 2023. And just as a, as a kind of a note there, the, the John Deere road component that the, that the county is doing, that has a completion date of the end of 2023. Now I'll talk uh, a little bit about the East-West Corridor initiatives. Uh, the U.S. Highway 20 corridor is the primary East-West route in the city of Dubuque and future traffic volume projections indicate that US Highway 20 alone will not provide sufficient capacity for east-west travel in the city. Capacity along alternate east-west corridors will need to be improved to provide connectivity between the western growth areas and the downtown urban core. In August of 2017, the City Council listed the East-West Corridor uh, Capacity Improvement Implementation as a policy agenda top priority in its goals and priorities. In an effort to advance this top priority, the City has already uh, completed $3.25 million in corridor improvements as shown on this slide. The section of University Avenue from Pennsylvania Avenue to Loris Boulevard is referred to as the overlap section. And it was recommended for converting the three intersections along University Avenue to roundabouts. In December of 2021, the Mayor and City Council approved the selection of HDR as the consultant to complete the preliminary, engin preliminary engineering design and the environmental clearance phase to advance the development of the East-West Corridor capacity improvements along University Avenue. As the city and consultant team progress through the preliminary design process over the next year, uh, there will be three public informational meetings. These public open house meetings will provide property owners and citizens the opportunity to receive information about the project and allow public an opportunity to provide input. Once the preliminary engineering and environmental clearance are completed, quarter impacts will be identified and property, ac 
property acquisition could begin and will take approximately two years to complete. Once property acquisition is done, um, within the overlap section, uh, construction to convert the three intersections along University Avenue to roundabouts could begin and would take approximately two to three years to complete. Um, the, uh, the new U.S. Highway 20 Swiss Valley Interchange that was recently completed by the Iowa DOT uh, impacted uh, City of Dubuque owned water main um, in the project area. So for the past two construction seasons, the engineering department and the water department have collaborated with the Iowa DOT to reroute and construct new water main along both Cottingham Road and North Cascade Road. The new relocated water main is now fully operational and provides the city with a more resilient and sustainable water distribution system. The city's cost share for the water main related work is approximately $753,000. And, uh, and although the Southwest Arterial was completed and opened to traffic in, in uh, August of 2020, um, over the past year, uh, we've been working closely with the Iowa DOT staff to finalize and close out multiple um, construction contracts. Uh, it's been a pretty significant effort, and the goal is to have all the contract administration work completed by the end of this month. And continuing on the uh, Southwest Arterial theme, another exciting project that staff is currently working on is the development and implementation of an intelligent transportation system, or ITS, network along the Southwest Arterial Corridor. The city had entered into a cooperative funding agreement with the Iowa DOT to install a fiber communications and ITS network consisting of cameras, sensors, dynamic message boards, um, and other related technology uh, to support transportation and public safety applications along the corridor. In return for the city designing, constructing, and operating and maintaining the fiber optic communications and ITS system, including providing fiber optics reserved to be used by the DOT, the state of Iowa is contributing $1.9 million to the project. And now I will turn it, uh, turn it back over to Gus. Uh, Gus Sahoya, city engineer. I'm gonna be presenting the traffic operation budget tonight. Uh, traffic engineers Dave Ness and Dwayne Richter are at the International Security Conference, which they learn a lot every year, so they've been going to that for several years now. But they will be on the phone tonight if you have any questions at the end of the presentation. Up in the Traffic Operations Center, located on the third floor of City Hall, the traffic engineers work in three main areas. Signal operation, the video management system, and communications infrastructure along with traffic studies for new developments and some street lighting projects. Because of all the new developments, more of our staff time is being dedicated to traffic impact studies. Looking to next year, we predict that the engineering department or traffic area in particular will be supporting fiber to the home build outs along with uh, many in-house communication projects. Some prior year highlights include an RFP and vendor selection for the streets project. Street stands for smart traffic routing with efficient and effective transportation systems. We also completed a large communication project on 16th Street that crosses the Piasta Channel Bridge, which feeds Schmidt Island. Engineering also set up standards working with uh, public uh, private partnerships involving fiber to the home projects Multiple vendors are building out in Dubuque now, and it's forecast that all homes in Dubuque will have fiber within the next four years. One future initiative involves building a major fiber backbone path across the Julian Dubuque Bridge, which would serve the bi-state needs with high speed communication at the fraction of the normal cost to cross the Mississippi. This is a collaborative project involving surrounding 
area DOTs, cities, and the Wisconsin Independent Network. Other future initiatives of the street pro streets program, the Southwest Arterial Camera Project and Fiber of the Home uh, with our private public partnerships and fiber backbone connections. Traffic engineers also operate and maintain the city of, city's video management system. The city is a product of, of many years of research and development and constantly evolving and growing. In 2021, for instance, we added 68 new cameras to the system, so we have a total right now in the traffic area alone of 1,307 cameras that operate 24 hours a day, and then we uh, maintain um, the video data for 30 days. One of the many uses of the video management systems for traffic operation. The traffic engineers regularly use the cameras to make traffic adjustments, uh, accident investigations. They look for historic traffic patterns, uh, confirm equipment and operational issues out in the field, and look for vehicular and pedestrian counting. Many cities throughout the country want to create a system similar to ours because the City of Dubuque's video management system is far more advanced and unique, preparing Dubuque well into the future. In the traffic area, we design new camera projects, then we install them, we maintain them, we replace them, and seeing the complete life cycle of these systems, I think that makes us a better at our job. Our goal in the traffic area is to maximize coverage with using fewer cameras in order to keep the maintenance cost the lowest that can be. The common daily uses of the camera system include engineering, public works, the police and fire department, and animal control, and we use it for special events also. Duties involved in our signal operations includes the maintenance of many devices and systems, many of which are related to the intelligent transportation systems, or ITS for short. ITS allows the city to improve traffic using electronic versus geometric improvements. So this is about one-tenth the cost of what uh, a geometric improvement would be. ITS uh, components need to be maintained and replaced to remain effective. Uh, these are a few systems that uh, require attention that's uh, labeled in the uh, slide here. Some daily duties related to signal operation are the maintenance and replacement of communication systems, signal knockdowns, which uh, I think everybody saw the one uh, back in December at JFK and Asbury Road that was knocked down and our traffic department took care of getting that back in order. Uh, and then continuing intersection detection maintenance, flashing beacons up like at Bryant School that we just recently put in, and then the traffic Im impact studies that are, are required for a lot of major developments and subdivisions. The Streets Project is a state-of-the-art traffic management concept that will combine many of the newest technologies in traffic and leverage existing city-invested infrastructure, such as our cameras, and fiber to be used and coordinate to improve traffic flow. The program reacts to congestion that is detected and predicted by the model and then change the signal timing based on traffic data and flow dissemination congestion and also gives alternate routes to the motorist. For this program to be successful, it will require quality, dedicated time from our traffic engineering staff that we will actually take the ownership of the system. RFP was recently re, uh, received and the Streets Selection Committee members are currently working on the recommendations so we can provide that to you in the next few um, months, hopefully. Uh, Streets is primarily funded through competitive state and federal grants from prior years as shown here with a total of $3.66 million. All the systems I've discussed so far run in the city's fiber communication infrastructure. In fact, none of these systems would exist without them. The vast uh, fiber system is what sets Dubuque apart from other cities in Iowa and the country, in fact. Uh, the fiber optic communication lines are becoming the arteries of the city. Much like the roads, fiber is critical utility, much like water and electricity. Uh, this year is especially important to have the communication infrastructure available because it allowed us to work from home and keep the city and the economy running. 
during that pandemic, um, we all saw that it could be incompleted. So um, this year, we'll, like Bob mentioned, we'll be putting in six and a half miles of uh, conduit on, on the southwest arterial. Uh, we currently are designing the malted duct system along this route to connect the south part of Dubuque with the west part. I'll now review the public-private builds that took place over the last few years. United Private Networks, UPN, uh, partnered with the city to install many miles of new duct. This win-win scenario installed 10 miles of fiber duct and connected gaps in the city's fiber infrastructure. This graphic shows uh, the Alliant Fiber Build. This joint project connected Cedar Rapids and Madison and passed through 14 miles uh, through the city of Dubuque. The 14 miles were broken up into many uh, sub-projects by street corridor, uh, then built in a manner to allow joint uh, partnerships between the providers. Uh, engineering partner with Alliant on the communication project uh, across the Mississippi to connect Iowa and Wisconsin via the Wisconsin Bridge. Uh, this will be able to support Dubuque's future communications with the, with the seven individual pathways that we installed. The traffic and department is also installing high capacity fiber, uh, which will um, be, have excess capacity for the future needs. When you combine all last year's projects with this summer's projects fiber, uh, you'll get 25 mile backbone loop around the city. This robust backbone will feed communication into all parts of the city with redundant failover options, meaning that if a fiber is cut in one area, it can back feed in the reverse direction to keep communication running. The city of Dubuque's dig once policy has done a great job in preserving right away, saving construction costs and allowing for the expansion of fiber communication pathways by multiple entities in an otherwise tight restricted corridors. This grouping of communication duct also makes locating the utilities more prominent as multiple agencies tend to be located in the same area. This project will be provided uh, by installing the cable and it's estimated to cost $400,000 using ARPA funding. Fiber backbone projects uh, will complete a 25 mile loop, like I said, around the city of Dubuque. The majority of the 17 mile duct is already installed via private-public partnerships over the last three years, and it's all sitting empty right now. The remaining six and a half miles of duct will be constructed as part of the Southwest Arterial ITS project that Bob mentioned. Uh, the backbone project will populate the 25 miles of duct with 432 single-mode fiber cable and will create a high-speed communication route that will function as the backbone for future city fiber communication projects and will minimize future expenditures needed to co connect city projects. Um, the fiber for this project was bought before COVID and now the lead times are at least um, almost a year right now. So this project will be built, built using $1.2 million of ARPA funding. So uh, we bought this uh, 45 miles of fiber previously and it cost about $478,000 when we bought it. So it's a good thing that we bought it. Uh, here's an updated chart. The blue line on the bottom shows the year of installation and the linear miles of fiber duct, uh, which totals about 100 miles of fiber duct in 2021. The orange line above that shows the multiplying factor of this mi micro duct that we're installing now. When the Southwest Arterial Fiber Route is in place, it will add roughly another half million feet of usable fiber space. This half million uh, feet of fiber duct equates to 97.5 miles. So we will nearly double the city's usable duct space in just one year. Many of these fiber projects are still under construction, but uh, we hope to have them done uh, May of this year. In 2016, when we initiated uh, to improve the broadband um, project, there was only a couple communication providers in Dubuque. Now there are 11. With the help of GDC, uh, thank you, Rick Dickinson, I see that he left, and uh, Dave Lyons, they have been wonderful asset and partner 
um, that we've created these many public um, private partner alliances. Um, this has lowered the cost of the broadband in Dubuque and allows for businesses to truly have redundancy available to them. Overall, this has moved Dubuque's broadband from a negative to a positive. With all the fiber build outs over the last year, most existing fiber funds will be used in the building of the duck. The next priority will be to install fiber into the duck and get the city's infrastructure connected. So this concludes the traffic portion of the presentation. Um, next, Steve Brown will um, talk about other improvement projects. Uh, so good evening, Mayor and City Council. Uh, Steve Sampson Brown, Project Manager. Here to talk to you a little bit. We'll talk about the facilities management team that just started up within our department over the last uh, or current fiscal year. So Justin Hogan's been here about five months and he's making great accomplishments. He's a, a great addition to our team at the city. Uh, a lot of technical capabilities, so we're glad to have him aboard. Here's just so, a list of some of the things that we've accomplished uh, just in the past several months. Uh, trying to get uh, ahead of some of the, the maintenance on uh, HVAC equipment, including here at the federal building. Uh, so we're working through equipment lead times and long ordering times, but we'll hopefully uh, get that back on track as soon as possible. Uh, in terms of uh, FY23, we have a pretty good uh, schedule of capital projects happening. Uh, we have some work going on at the annex, uh, city hall security, uh, brick tuck pointing of the exterior building envelope, uh, hum, uh, some funding for the Human Resources Office to uh, uh, accommodate their new employees. And we also have some, uh, again, building envelope uh, money for the Multicultural Family Center. And also, most excitingly, the Office of Shared Prosperity renovation. So we're about 80% through the design phase right now. Uh, we just got our first round of budgets in last week. So this is how the numbers are looking for that particular project. It'll be located at the old engine house at 18th and uh, Central. 18th Street and Central Avenue. Here's just a floor plan. So there'll be an office for Anderson, uh, a lot of flex space here. So this is, a, I'd say, a modern office design, accommodate uh, large groups. We can move the furniture around. So I think it'll accommodate the needs of the Office of Shared Prosperity, their employees, and also uh, the, the visitors that they plan to have at that building. In terms of the uh, miscellaneous uh, capital improvement projects here, I'll start and then uh, Bob will finish it up. So we talked about earlier the Chaplain Schmidt Veterans Memorial, uh, great project. Uh, one story I like to tell, so it, it's again a high visibility project, so having been able to spend a fair amount of time out there near the end of the project, a woman walked up and she said she was from the state of Maine and she was an auxiliary uh, American Legion member. She was driving by on the highway, had no intention of stopping Dubuque, but saw the project from the highway and it was so excellent that she had to pull off and come in and visit it. So it is getting attention uh, as people are coming through town. So that's good to see. See the veterans get the recognition they deserve. Uh, Ryan um, Nucky earlier tonight uh, talked about some of the mobility things going on. So uh, the engineering department in partnership with the economic development office and the transportation services office uh, worked on this past year, the US EPA technical assistance, which is no cost to the city. They provide their consult to us for free. And we discussed emerging mobility. So this was a good way to whet the appetite of the smart parking and mobility management plan. Uh, it was during COVID, so uh, their normal process is to do stakeholder engagement in person. This time we did it virtually. Uh, so we partnered with a lot of nonprofit organizations and NICC and different organizations like that. So while we didn't expect to have a lot of individual residents attend uh, online sessions, the organizations that represent those people, the Lantern Center, things like that, they were definitely involved, so we got some good feedback from them. Again, just the three, or sorry, four focus areas that came out of that, collaboration with employers to address local workforce needs, so there was a lot of discussion with uh, the help of Greater Dubuque Development to start some conversations about getting workers that are, live in the downtown area out to the industrial park, Obviously, our transit schedule is, is not uh, really flexible, especially if you need to go to daycare or, or go to a, uh, get groceries on the way home. So there's a, we started those conversations with some employers. 
Uh, second focus area, access to opportunities through enhanced transit service and information, so that's the smart parking and mobility management plan. Focus area three, a walkable and vibrant downtown through pedestrian friendly infrastructure, and we've got some other CIPs in FY23 that I'll touch on that start to address those points. And focus area four, innovative solutions to address transportation needs. So now we're talking about mobility as a service, micro transit, those type of things that again, we'll also be looking at in this calendar year as part of the smart mobility uh, project. Uh, just wanna list here, so obviously my goal is, or role is to work with other departments that don't often build construction projects. So just a list of some ongoing things that um, we've been able to help myself and some other uh, people in our office, uh, different departments with as they proceed through the, their capital project list. Uh, within our own department, here's just a quick list of uh, currently funded projects that we're working on. Uh, to highlight, uh, we have work at the federal building here happening. So uh, we previously, the nice white roof is uh, the work we previously did, uh, I think it was two summers ago. We still need to come back and do the penthouse roof. Uh, that periodically leaks. So. I'm sure Alexis Steger will be happy when that work is done, and we're gonna get on that uh, this calendar year. Uh, loading dock repairs, so again, the building was built in 1934. It's in pretty good shape in many areas, but some areas are, are getting worn out, so we'll uh, fix some concrete on the loading dock, which when we have a driving rain gets wet, and then we get water in the basement, so it's, it's more than just a aesthetic improvement. And then the uh, energy study for HVAC improvements. So things like the cooling tower and the roof, uh, very long past its typical service life, and instead of trying to piecemeal as uh, parts break, the idea is to have a holistic plan. So one thing we learned in 2008 when we renovated this building and redid the, this area and the housing department area is that many of the, much of the duct work, which hid, is hidden in the ceilings, is too small to meet current codes. There's a certain amount of air changes per hour to bring fresh air into the building. So as we look at a new system and begin to look at chillers and things like that, we'll have to look at duct sizes. And this study will give us a capital improvement priority list with, with numbers, so we'll understand where's the money need to go next, what's the, what's the cost magnitude, and we'll have a systematic approach. And in case a piece of equipment wears out before we can fully implement the plan, we'll understand where that piece fits in the bigger puzzle. So we'll have a much better uh, implementation process as we uh, generally upgrade the equipment here at the building. Uh, so the next one, so in the current fiscal year, we have the Bloom Site Utilization Study. Darren talked about this uh, a little bit earlier. So again, the goal of that study is to provide a clear site redevelopment plan uh, for both the public and the staff. There's certain things we understand we need to do through the existing EPA grants, but um, for instance, the building in the photo on the left will still be standing when we're done. Structurally, it's not in good shape, so we need to take that down. And again, just a prioritized and phased list of redevelopment improvements. We understand that you know, we can't uh, afford a big number all at once potentially, so we need to be strategic about how we go about addressing this to make it uh, a better place to look for the neighborhood. And then a list of uh, potential city services that might be able to happen in, in the smaller building on Elm Street that's been discussed. Darren showed you this slide. So this is previous conversations up to today. Uh, that things that have been discussed through previous budgets, those will be uh, looked at. And then again, through our EPA stakeholder engagement phase that we're required to do, uh, this is some of the, the brainstorming that we did with the uh, public engagement. And the, this is one of the outcomes now. This is obviously the, uh, the highest and best use of the property, if you ask me, but uh, there's other scales. So when we bring to, back to you the planning study, we'll have a full level of from almost do nothing to minimalistic improvements to, to maybe a more grand vision and you'll be able to make the choice as to what you think is appropriate for this area. Uh, moving on to fiscal year 23. Again, it's a busy year for myself and the people I work with in the department, helping out other departments. Uh, some of the things we're talking about is electrical vehicle charging. So we're gonna have our uh, new charger in the Port of Dubuque by the end of this calendar year in the Port of Dubuque ramp. And then we're looking at a, uh, with the help of Dave Lyons at Greater Dubuque Development, a new round of uh, Volkswagen grant funds. And we're uh, looking probably here in the back of the federal building. So we'd have a mix of public and private use or, or city use. So 
For instance, the housing department is, has a fair amount of uh, vehicle fleets. They would be able to access it with, as they purchase new electric vehicles. And then if you're visiting Five Flags or coming down to uh, an activity at Washington Park or over by the Felon Place elevator, again, that, that's for public. So now we're kind of serving this, this area of the neighborhood for public use. So that's why we're looking at the, uh, this general block. Um, again, just another list of uh, some of our more intensive projects here. I'll highlight a few um, as we go through. A uh, new parking ramp, again, Ryan already spoke to you about that, so I won't bring much up. We've, again, just a different visual of that. So we're, we're planning at the block between 8th and 9th and between White and Central. It's going to be a half block is the current concept that we uh, are working forward with. And of course, as we implement the Roshek Development Agreement and the Smart Parking and Mobility Plan, that may impact the, the ramp schedule, if, uh, but this is the current concept. Uh, this is what it's going to look like, approximately seven levels. Uh, and again, the focus was not to dominate the courthouse as a, an important vista in the downtown, so we, we pushed it back towards White Street, so that's why it's located on that side. Smart parking and mobility management plan. Uh, you asked some questions to Ryan, so I'm not gonna repeat the same information. Uh, just a reminder, so we kind of picked a downtown study area. So mobility's all people to all things, and we talked about point of origin to point of destination is what mobility means to this study. So we picked in the red area, a primary focus area in the heart of the downtown. But then we realize that people just don't stop when they get to the end of the edge of the red. They continue up the hill. They might go to senior high school. They might go to Finley Hospital. Uh, so we kind of expanded a secondary area in, in terms of mobility. So we'll take a look at that. Part of the, um, the study we'll look at, we'll have a robust stakeholder engagement phase. We'll have a supply and demand analysis. Again, the... Uh, uh, Remote workers, you know, we can look around and see who's back in town, but is it going to be like that four years from now? We don't know. So we're going to do a lot of stakeholder engagement, both with the people who work in downtown, live in downtown, and of course the employers in downtown, and really trying to understand, you know, are the ramps going to stay at their current level of capacity, or is, are we seeing trends that might indicate it might change? We'll also look at uh, new technology evaluation. So we want to be able to figure out are our ramps full, are our parking lots full, uh, publicly and then how do we get that information to our customers so they can park most conveniently as they're arriving into Dubuque maybe for a concert at Five Flags where should I park if I want to spend less on parking what are my options if I want to spend uh, be as close as possible what are my options and we'll try and make that uh, as easily available to users of our system as possible and of course the financial modeling um, very important uh, it's not free to park and it's not free to maintain these parking ramps so we'll be looking at multiple financial models that include stakeholder impact, uh, input and then coming back and talking to you about that and and see what uh, the, the indications are that people what direction people would like to move in also talk about safety in the downtown area so again point of origin to point of destination I get off the bus am I comfortable walking that extra block and a half to where I live or or my work so this is a drone flight, uh, and again, the yellow area is the uh, high-pressure sodium, uh, older-style lights. The white areas are the new LED fixtures, and you can see very well from this photo, there's some areas that are really bright, and the yellow areas aren't so great. And then in the bottom left-hand screen, there's some kind of dark areas. So uh, tools like this will let us evaluate safety, people's level of comfort being out in the downtown area at night, and again, we'll look to uh, make improvements as part of this and the city manager mentioned the uh, recent uh, Roshek development agreement amendment so again we'll be adding code blue phones and we'll using information like this to improve lighting in the downtown area uh, overlapping with the mobility study we have what we're calling the connecting downtown destination study so the idea of this study is to say if I want to get from the millwork district to out to Chaplin Schmidt Island, or maybe I want to get on the B Branch and, and ride up to the Heritage Trail. You know, what are those paths? Some, if, you know, Jackson Street, or is it Washington Street? Certain streets are better than others. Um, and we'll identify corridors. So again, if I'm leaving the Millwork District, do I head up Kerper Boulevard by the JOTC and, 
and reach Chapel and Schmidt Island that way, or should I be heading north and then east on 16th Street? So again, Port of Dubuque, even the South Port, and then of course people want to heads up to the universities at the top of the bluff. So this study will again take a holistic view. Where do people want to go? How do they want to get there? What are the most desired routes that need to be improved? And we'll be able to use this information in concert with the uh, mobility plan development. Uh, recently, there's been conversations about the railroad uh, merger with the Canadian National and Kansas City Southern Railroad. Uh, the data shows that potentially the railroad's saying in 2027, after they merge, we could be seeing 18 trains a day. So that's a lot of trains. Uh, it's, the trains can be loud now if you live in the abutting neighborhoods. So we have funding this year to start what's called a railroad quiet zone study, which is a partnership with the city. The Canadian Pacific Railroad, who owns the track in this area in the photo, and as you can see, I, there's nine crossings that we plan to study from 9th Street north all the way up to the Lock and Dam. These are the at-grade crossings, and in order to go to a quiet zone, which is a whistle-free area, all nine of these locations will need to be improved with gates or, or different other mitigation measures before the railroad agrees that it's safe enough and their conductors do not need to blow the train whistle as they pass through. So the study is $43,000. The implementation is much more expensive and we can't really give you a number because we really need to look at each location individually. So, uh, but there'll be more to come, but at least we'll start and we'll have, a, have a, a better idea of what's needed and hopefully we can leverage some of the infrastructure grants that are coming out in the future. The other thing we have going on is Chaplain Schmidt. So we, uh, in the current fiscal year, we have local match money for what we're calling the Ca Chaplain Schmidt Connector Trail. So if you cross the bridge over Piasta Channel and arrive on City Island, you can loop down under the bridge and head north uh, to the north of the highway. That's a pretty good trail. If you want to go south and go straight towards uh, the Mystique Ice Arena or Veterans Memorial, the softball fields, we don't really have a good route. Um, recently, uh, Terry Goodman informed us that we received the uh, Federal Community Projects Grant, uh, formerly known as the Earmark type of project. So that's $615,000. We'll match that with our, our local match here. And as soon as we get the federal paperwork in place, we'll be starting the design and construction of this project. Uh, on this next slide, we'll see now we cross over Admiral Sheehy Drive. That area in orange uh, in the uh, community grant was written up as a trailhead and parking area in the original Chaplain Schmidt design plans. It was a bid alternative that we weren't be able to afford and that was the designated the picnic and overlook area. So uh, the overlook had a, we received bids on that and it was uh, $450,000 just for the overlook and the picnic area was a $125,000. Again, that was bid as an alternate that we weren't able to accept on the memorial project. So just to give you an egg idea of magnitude of how much those things are, but we'll work to include those within the trail budget. And then we recently submitted a land and water conservation fund grant that would get us uh, past the driveway into the Veterans Memorial uh, along Admiral Sheehy Drive all the way down to the Iowa DNR boat ramp. So we're, we're moving forward through a series of projects to extend the trail network on, on City Island. Uh, we also have the EPA multi-purpose grant. Again, this is a grant that involves $800,000 of federal grant funds that comes to the city for us to spend. The local match is $40,000. However, that local match is in kind. So my time, Jill Connors, anybody else at the city, we track our time and that's the local match. So there's not an out of pocket requirement. There's three cleanup sites identified in the EPA grant, the Comiskey Park. So again, we'll be cleaning up some of the contamination that was just north of 24th Street, which is planned to be the parking lot and basketball court area in the new park master plan. So this, these project funds help with the, expand the park budget and we can do more. Uh, and then we have two areas identified in the, in the south port for cleanup. The Dodds Terminal site is at, uh, just north of the Highway 20 bridge and the Sinclair, former Sinclair Oil site is just south of the Highway 20 bridge. Both of those are between Terminal Street and the flood wall. So that's kind of prime real estate property, so we're starting to again prepare that for future development. In our current uh, leasehold uh, improvement CIP, we'll be getting rid of that concrete square with the red arrow. That's the former Dodds Terminal building. 
a very old warehouse. The building's gone, the foundation's still there, so we have money to get rid of that. And then these, there's a rail spur coming off of First Street that's uh, half buried in the ground, and we'll be uh, getting that out of the way. Again, getting the Southport ready for uh, slowly phased future development. In terms of the riverfront leases, uh, right now I counted this morning, uh, both riverfront but also cell tower, our department manages 50 plus individual lease and broadband agreements. I would be remiss if I didn't thank Anita Gagnier in our office who tracks those. Each one has a different start date, renewal date. Each one has a different payment calculation. So it's a quite a bit of, uh, of time spending to keep track of all that. And she does an amazing job. Current uh, rent coming in in fiscal year 23 is projected to be for lease revenue, $3.4 million and additional $182,000 in wharfage fees. With that, I'll turn it back to Bob Schizel. Again, Bob Schizel, we're almost done, so hang in there with us. All right, I'm going to talk about the uh, Port of Dubuque um, riverfront uh, dock expansion project. So. Based on uh, the forecasted increase in excursion boat, uh, riverboat traffic on the Mississippi River, the city wishes to expand the existing riverfront docking facility to accommodate large excursion boats in the Port of Dubuque. In February of 2020, the city council approved a riverfront docking agreement with Viking River Cruises. Uh, Viking will begin uh, river cruises this summer and they have already established the Port of Dubuque as a destination port of call um, on their Mississippi River cruise itinerary. Per the terms of the docking agreement, Viking will retain exclusive docking rights and dedicated use of the docking facility uh, when their cruise vessels are moored at the port. In return for said exclusive docking rights, Viking has agreed to participate in the cost to design and construct an expanded docking facility along the Port of Dubuque Riverfront. Additionally, Viking has agreed to participate in the cost for the annual operations and maintenance expenses for the docking facility. The new docking facility will create an opportunity for significant tourism growth in Dubuque. Increased tourism, will create employment in retail, dining, ground transportation, and excursions to local attractions, while other tourism-related sectors will benefit as a result. Staff is currently working with, Vi with the Viking team on final design and regulatory permitting. Construction of the expanded docking facility is anticipated to begin this summer once all permitting and approvals are obtained. All right, we, we previously talked about this uh, in, in Marie's presentation, but I'll uh, um, talk a little bit about the, uh, the uh, Mystique project. Um, so the en engineering department has, has been, and we will continue uh, to have a very active role in the remediation work that will, will occur over the next year. It's, it's very important and I, wanna, and I wanna stress that the building structure itself is constructed and supported on deep foundations and, we, and, the, and the existing building is not showing any signs of settlement or moving, okay? The building structure itself. Um, what is moving is the, is the, is the main floor. Um, so the exhibit on the, on the screen right here, the, the red colored uh, the colored arena floor plan exhibit graphically displays the observed settlement throughout the main floor and the rink area that are not foundation supported. The red shaded areas uh, on the floor plan indicate four plus inches of settlement that has been observed. So following the adoption of the uh, FY23 budget, staff is preparing uh, to initiate the public bidding process for the settlement remediation project in April. 
The plan is to close the arena on June 1 and begin construction. The first phase of work will be to remove the ice rink, which is highlighted there in green. Uh, this will allow the installation of a deep foundation system under the ice rink. The ice rink will then be reinstalled on a foundation supported concrete slab. So you can see there's kind of a plan view of the rink looking down and then below is the, the cross section that kind of help everybody see where the, the foundation remediation work is going to happen. In the other main floor areas of the arena, the red shaded areas, these are areas with low ceilings and limited access, um, such as locker rooms, offices, hallways. Um, this will require non-destructive uh, techniques that will use to be used to perform the subsurface soil stabilization, um, such as deep compaction grouting, deep injection polymers, or deep polyurethane foam grouting. The settlement remediation project is scheduled to be completed by November 1st, and the arena will then be uh, reopened to the public. So that concludes our presentation, and, and we will be happy to take any questions. All right, thank you. Well, first, let's open up to public comment for one last time here. At this time, anyone participating in the meeting in person who would like to discuss this public hearing may approach the podium when the mayor asks if there is any in-person input for this public hearing. For all remote attendees, please enter your name and address in the chat function and state your question, or state your name and address over the phone when the mayor asks if there is any virtual input for this public hearing. Please begin your input by stating your name and address. Do we have any public comment in chambers? I see none. Do we have any virtual? No virtual comment. All's received. Back to the table. Mr. Mayor. Yes, Mr. Sprank. Thank you. Thank you, Gus, for everything you guys are doing. I mean, when you think about it, I'm just Chaplain Schmidt Island connector trail trails, how people are going to really enjoy that, the safety from the cameras, the fiber that people need to get connected, the working with parks, the B Branch project that's been going on for 20 plus years, streets, the green alleys. It's a lot. And thank you. Um, and I know you had a lot of really cool um, recommend uh, packages that you wanted to get that we couldn't approve all of them. But I was wondering if next year you could ask for it again. It wasn't approved this year. It was number four. It was the Youth AmeriCorps program where you're trying to get kids involved and excited about construction. So could you please make sure to ask for that one again? Okay. Thank you. Okay. Appreciate it. All right. And uh, one other thing that I didn't see, we talked a lot about streets. Um, I didn't see anything about that Northwest Arterial project where the DOT was going to take over some things. And also, that I know that will eventually kind of tie into our hopeful central project. Are we looking at how that, how we're going to be doing all these traffic patterns as well as potentially working in construction? I'm thinking out loud here, and you can correct me if I'm wrong. If that project gets done, then Central gets going on. About the same time, the East-West Corridor, the East-West project will be going on. All of a sudden, we're going to have a lot of people not being able to get around the city. So just wondering if we're thinking about all those projects. We've been looking at it. Um, again, um, Bob mentioned that the, the Northwest Arterial Project is not going to be complete this year like we mentioned. It's going to be actually next August, I think is the completion date that the DOT set for us. So we will be meeting with uh, businesses over the next, and we've started doing that already. We've met with several businesses, so we'll be looking at traffic patterns and making recommendations and meeting with them over the next months and next year to determine all the different factors that you mentioned with all the conflicts in construction. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Farber. Yes. Um, so I have a couple of questions, but um, first off, I want to thank you very much for the installation and all the work behind it, starting with the um, citizens uh, sending us emails um, about the traffic beacons by Bryant School. And I want to thank both you and Mike for getting that um, completed for them because there was a lot of concern about the kids crossing 
uh, South Grandview and that intersection not once but twice in order to get through the island to the school. And um, they are just so pleased uh, with the beacon. So I just wanted to uh, shout out to all those families that connected with us to communicate with us about this problem and then to thank you for your quick response. Um, thank you. This is a question that kind of goes back to the conversation last night with Willie um, about the lift station and odor abatement. And if you remember last fall, I met with some residents from Kelly Lane and the Valentine Street area, and we actually toured three of the lift stations uh, within the city to talk about the potential odor abatement issues that may arise from the new two lift stations, uh, one in the Manson Road area and the other in Granger. Uh, just was wondering if there is some consideration in the design for odor abatement and if the uh, particulate um, filtration system that we had talked about is included in uh, the design. Abs absolutely. There's two different uh, uh, recommendations that we're looking at right now by the consultant strand engineer that's working with the design, and we're going to be evaluating the two different methods. One's, you know, more intense than the other one, so we're going to determine which one would be more appropriate initially. Okay, so well, we'll thank be, you for we'll, that. And, and I also wanted to give you a shout out. I thought the design was really very nicely done um, for the Manson Road section um, of the lift station. It looks like a house and it looks like it belonged to that um, older section of that city sure. section. So thank you yeah, for that I'd too. I'd like to thank Todd Irwin that's taken the management of that project over along with Steve and Darren. So we're yeah, really making sure it's integrated in the in the neighborhood. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Yeah. Mr. Resnick. Mayor, thank you. First of all, thank you for a great presentation. Um, uh, before I begin, I wanted to say that uh, I, I'm just going to bring up something I want the citizens to know. I mentioned $3.4 million of riverfront lease revenue. I just want the citizens to know about $3.3 .3 million of that is a result of Mr. Van Milligan's determination to get market rates for riverfront access. I'm still astounded when that happened and, and what you did for the, to help the citizens of Dubuque. Um, and now for the engineering, uh, m almost all of those projects made a lot of sense to me and uh, all but one. And that was the $100,000 for the downtown connection uh, destination study. Um, and why I say that is, uh, I know a lot of people, they need to know how to get to where you want to go after you get lost. I mean, we go down there, everybody gets lost, and then we try to figure out where we're going. And also the GPS, which I have a couple, and they all say different things and they do crazy things. So you have these people, I don't know how, I don't know what exactly the point of the study is or, or how you're going to really determine you know, what people, where people are trying to go, or are you going to ask them wh where they are, where they're going, and how they intend to do it? Are you going to actually uh, follow people? Uh, it was $100,000, and I guess they didn't know the overall goal. What are, we, what are we trying to do, help people not get lost, or to ignore the GPS, or what are we doing? I think I'm going to defer that to Steve Sampson Brown. That So the, the study is really a uh, subset of the mobility study. So it's really about if you're not in a vehicle, again, what are the, we're starting to hear from feedback from uh, work in the Millwork District, uh, some of the downtown businesses, you know, people want to get from the Roshek building to the Millwork District. So we as staff need to figure out like, okay, are we going to look at 7th Street and have it, try and have everybody walk down 7th Street? Or are we going to encourage people to walk down 8th or 9th? So it's really pathways, multi-use trails. And I, it's more complicated than that just because you can't get a multi-use trail everywhere. But like I said, the best example is if you're on a bike and you want to go, you're in the Millwork District and you're going to take a bike ride at lunch and you want to go out to City Island, where do you run your bike? Because Kerper Boulevard right now is not the safest place to put a bike on. Uh, as you leave 9th or 11th Street and head up Kerper Boulevard to the Kerper and 16th intersection. So we're going to look at, uh, with a, again, a collaboration of stakeholders, downtown businesses, uh, Tri-State Trail Vision, organizations like that. Do we think the Kerper improvements on Kerper Boulevard 
would be a better way to move people from the Millwork District to City Island, or do we think we'd push them north and then turn them east? And then once we do that, we'll have a uh, watercolor concept of a look and feel. So it's almost the backbone of a trail network. I, that's probably the best way I can explain the concept. Because we have trails now, for instance, JC Trail gets you from 16th and Kerper up to uh, AY McDonald Park. But if you work in one of those buildings and you want to take your bike home to Fengler, across Fengler, there's no sidewalks on Kerper Boulevard. And you may not go out of your way to ride the JC's trail just to get to Fengler Avenue so you can get home to the, the Point neighborhood. So it'll be looking at paths and flows like that. That's, that's the concept. I, I get what you're saying, I suppose. I mean, I'm down there with my bike all the time. I go like five different ways, five different times. And it's interesting, the bike path is along ja Jackson, but I, Washington is much better for many reasons. Uh, and I guess I would think that we could, with our staff, kind of look where people want to go and choose it rather than spend $100,000. If there was a better way, an obvious way, then people would do go that way. Because everything's equal right now, I think, well, it'll be interesting, I suppose, if you found and determined to do the study and you've, you've thought about it. Uh, I just, I guess I, I, I'm, I'm not fully um, buying what, what we're doing right there because again, there's a lot of different ways, a lot of different people to do. I, good point, I think, about you know, the, the area by Fengler, all that. That's a, that's a good point. Well, maybe we should concentrate on that or, 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 or choose something. I, uh, I suppose we're all into stakeholders and, and talking to people. I understand that. It just seems to me this particular project, and I'm done, it's been late, and everybody's wishing that I, that I stop. But, uh, you know, it is that one. I don't know if we want to rethink this. or Maybe your department has already gone through this, and Mr. Van Milligan has approved it. So it's making sense to a lot of smart people, just not me. All right, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Beer. Any others? No? Before, Not even 10 o'clock yet. Yeah, really. Before we end, I just want to thank all the engineering staff here tonight uh, and all the engineering staff at home. Everybody, I think the thing I proud myself the most is the excellent city engineering department that we have. I mean, you saw tonight, everything was excellent, I thought. So I want to thank everybody here and uh, everybody at home. Yeah, thank you for saying that, Gus. Do you all feel like you just have the coolest job in the entire city? I mean, I have to ask that question sometimes because, I mean, just all the projects that you have, and that's no knock on any of the other departments that came before you. I mean, we've seen some amazing things in this budget presentation. But, you know, um, what you get to do is not just the things that are below the, the street that people don't get to see, but it's the stuff that people look at every day. All day long, uh, you know, and the story that you told about, um, you know, somebody driving by and, and seeing the Veterans Memorial and stopping to see those things. I mean, that's the kind of, that's the work we're talking about here. And it's not just the work for what we're going to see today, but it's the things that we're looking at way down the road. I mean, the, the fiber redundancy that you talked about around the entire city, that, that, that's not something that, I don't think I, if I'd heard about it before, I hadn't put it together in my head in the way that you showed us tonight. And I thought that, uh, I mean, it's just incredible that we're going to have that level of planning in a city that is already ahead in many ways when it comes to our connectivity. So uh, great work and thank you very much for, for what you've proposed tonight. Um, fully supportive of the, of the proposals that you have on the table, so. Thank, thank you and the council and the city manager and everybody, all the department heads that we work with every day. We thank them, They're, everybody's excellent to yeah. work with. Great. Thanks. Well, thanks for closing us out. We will be back here Tuesday night to uh, finally approve this budget that's before us. So thanks for everybody. And with no further business, we are adjourned. Thank you.